Hello and welcome back to this Davenport Idealistic Crusade. I am the motion picture analyst, and this commentary track continues in my series for the official Eon-produced James Bond films, and we will be discussing the 11th film in the series, which, of course, is 1979's Moonraker, which has, I believe, unfairly become one of the great uh, derided black sheeps of the film series, and hopefully in this commentary I can encourage those fans who often, uh, you know, give it a, uh, a, a writing off or, uh, you know, always speak of it disparagingly, uh, hopefully I can encourage even Bond fans to take a more serious and critical look at Moonraker, uh, because as I've said with all the previous commentaries, it is beyond important to view these films in the context, the historical context of their original release and the uh, theatrical marketplace they were released to. Uh, the period of 1979, not only being the turn of a decade, but in the post-Star Wars landscape, uh, was a really divisive time uh, in the film industry, particularly in Hollywood, uh, because it was the point at which there was a paradigm shift uh, that was starting to take place that would lead to the uh, focus more on the blockbuster post Jaws and Star Wars and the rise of conglomerates taking further interest in not just the film industry, but actually running individual film studios, uh, which Bond would come to deal with throughout the rest of the 1980s. So Moonraker is a film that uh, it's obviously following the lead of The Spy Who Loved Me, and in fact, I think you could go as far to say as the entire film is literally following the playbook of The Spy Who Loved Me, the film that immediately preceded it, which was uh, a vastly successful, almost relaunching of the series. Uh, the first film produced solo by Cubby Broccoli after Harry Saltzman's departure and the selling of his shares to United Artists. So Moonraker being the second film, they did not have the pressure on, as it were, uh, that they did on The Spy Who Loved Me since Spy came out and was ridiculously successful and uh, it removed some of that pressure. But there was an additional pressure to live up to expectations and deliver something that was bigger and better than what had come before, which always goes with a Bond film. But with Moonraker, since Spy was so successful in uh, reinvigorating the series and attracting a worldwide global audience in 1977, uh, and was a film that was designed to go bigger than the immediately preceding films, uh, you know, where do you go but up? And so with Spy being even a larger budgeted film at about $15 million, uh, Moonraker wound up costing over double that. Uh, its final budget was somewhere around $32, $33 million in 1979 money. So there are a number of factors that make Moonraker really a, an outlier. It, it, there's not really another film like it in the series. And I'm not talking about the science fiction aspects and, and the things people sort of write it for. Some of the humor gets a little bit cartoonish in places, and there is some goofiness there. I'm not talking about that. I, I mean other qualities. Uh, we'll try to bring up throughout this commentary and, and try and highlight some of those, which is part of why I think Moonraker is such a re rewarding experience, because there are certain elements that make it uh, stand alone among all other Bond films, and it, it's a film that doesn't get looked at critically, hardly ever, if, if ever, really, uh, because the reputation is such as being one of the uh, supposed black sheep of the original Bond films. It usually, uh, you know, sort of pivots on, on which one people like to hate on at any given time. Uh, you know, it's usually, uh, some people like to complain about Diamonds Are Forever, or it's The Man with the Golden Gun, or it's Moonraker, or it's A View to a Kill. It's usually one of the four. Uh, and none of the films really get a fair shake. And then, of course, the reason why I'm doing these commentaries in the first place is I get tired of Bond films not being taken seriously and having all these thoughts floating around in my head every day. So uh, just just felt the need to at least try and get some of what runs through my head uh, every time I rewatch the films yearly and uh, just various facts and factoids about the production that I think help to enrich the viewing experience. So as, as always, I like to preface these. These are not meant to be a definitive making of or a history of the films. And I do a running commentary w with a lot of scene-specific character analysis and things like that. So uh, 
I, I don't get into as much of the uh, you know nitty gritty details as often as I would like to, but I, I try to make it a, an interesting listing experience and uh, you know keep it much more as uh, Roger Moore always said in his Bond commentaries as if it was a one sided conversation with a friend of sorts, just simply talking about the Bond films. So again, these are not professionally recorded, and uh, do do try and bear that in mind if if any. Uh, technical mishaps happen. I try to edit those out, but uh, again, these are meant to be fun, and hopefully you get something out of it, and uh, I hope this track in particular might help some people to uh, look at Moonraker much more seriously, because there are great riches in the film, and it is a just beautifully and handsomely mounted production, the likes of which you simply do not see anymore. And if any Bond film described the notion of the money is up there on the screen, which is so often, uh, you know, one of the um, the compliments Bond films, or at least the original films, always got, uh, deservedly so, uh, Moonraker, you see every single cent on the screen. It is a lavish film, which is part of the reason why I think so many people have issues with it, is they may talk about the goofiness and things, but what they're really reacting to, I think, most of all, is the the richness of the film being so uh, you know overdone compared to other films in the series. And I think it's this quality, this lavishness, this richness, uh, and the fact that it was produced in France, you know, it, it gives it an otherworldly factor that while it makes it stand alone, and a lot of people may have a sort of knee-jerk reaction to that, I, I think that actually fits in very well with this being the outer space Bond, where Bond finally does go into space. So with a space film with a lot of science fiction elements, it makes sense to have an otherworldly element. And I think the French production combined with the extraordinary lavishness of the production and the increased budget, I think all of these factors, with some others I'll try and mention throughout the track, I think these sort of combine in, in the soup of the production, as it were, if you want to make it make a lot of uh, food terms uh, and references, I, I think it adds to the mixture and, and, and makes the overall experience much richer and fits in perfectly with the uh, science fiction and outer space uh, atmosphere. So, with all that being said, let's just jump into this. Uh, go ahead and look at whatever copy of the film you want to try and sync the commentary up with. And again, you don't have to listen to these with a version of the film. If you want to listen to me babble on about Moonraker and double-taking pigeons uh, to your heart's content without viewing the film, that is entirely doable. Uh, but anyway, if you want to try and sync with a copy of the film, we'll do a rough sync right about now. And don't worry if it's not, it's not going to be exactly perfect because, of course, different versions of the, of the film have different logos and uh, depending on what part of the world you're in, if you're looking at, say, a DVD, it could be you're watching in the UK with a PAL copy with the different frame rate anyway. Uh, but anyway, just go ahead and queue up in the opening gun barrel. Uh, try and queue to somewhere around the start of the gun barrel, just, just before the uh, gun barrel iris comes into frame. So uh, try and pause right there on the black screen. That's usually the best way to do these, to try and get around the uh, differences of the opening logos, which change on practically every release of a film. So, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, somewhere around the black, uh, black frames or right as that iris is coming in on the left side of the frame. Go ahead and cue it up there. And then we'll do a rough count in, and then uh, you can press play, and we will go from there. Again, this is a rough sync, so don't, don't worry if it's not exactly perfect. So uh, with your copies ready, uh, also I, I usually mention the, the soundtracks on the earlier films, try and listen to the original mono audio. Uh, but Moonraker is the first Bond film that was actually released in Dolby Stereo. Uh, whereas Spy had a uh, stereo four-track mix for the premiere engagements, which is why we have uh, the stereo surround versions on disc, uh, Moonraker was Dolby Stereo across the board with 70mm blow-ups featuring a six-track uh, Dolby 70mm mix. Uh, so on disc, that you will usually have a 5.1 version of that, and then some versions do include the original uh, 2.0 matrix, matrix surround uh, Dolby surround track that you would have seen on the 35 millimeter release version and that's what was on all of the uh, VHS and Laserdisc and beta releases throughout the years uh, 
so anyway, with Moonraker, you're you're pretty good. You don't have to worry about uh, audio remixes changing any elements. You know, I don't have to put a disclaimer uh, on these. You know, look for the original audio pretty much from uh, Spy onwards, because all the uh, all the films pretty much were not uh, remixed. It was pretty much just the mono films that had that uh, sorry fate and still suffer from that. And those mixes are really unfortunate. Um, so anyway. Have your version of the film queued up, and in five, four, three, two, one, press play now. And we're here in the gun barrel, which is the reshot gun barrel in scope for Spy. But here we have John Barry doing the gun barrel because, of course, he returns to score the film. And right here, his music in the gun barrel, you can tell. His, the style of his scoring is a bit different. Moonraker really marks the point where uh, Barry's shift into his later, more romantic, string-led style of his later scores in, in the in the you know second half of his career. Uh, that's where you see it pop up in the Bond films. There's a little touch of that in The Man with the Golden Gun. Then he goes away for Spy, comes back for Moonraker, and it's there in full force. Now, this, of course, pre is the pre-title sequence, and, you know, when you look at Moonraker's structure, it is literally the spy who loved me. So, you know, people who want to label spy a remake of You Only Live Twice, well, Moonraker sort of builds on that as well. But it was really more of just trying to up the ante on the success of what came before. And, uh, but, you know, it still works as a film in its own right, but you could definitely recognize the DNA of the spy who loved me in it. Now, I have to mention really quickly, I've always loved the sort of setup of this with the hijacking of the shuttle, but uh, there are many, many similarities to the opening of Spy, and then we have this incident, and then we're introduced to Bond, who gets, you know, sensibly called into M's office once the, uh, the title sequence happens. But Barry's score already is highlighting the drama of all of this, and this becomes a moment, particularly as, as a young kid when you see this a million times, it's very impactful. And you see beautiful model work from Derek Meddings, who once again, as he did on The Spy Who Loved Me, really elevates this film. And uh, Spy and Moonraker are pretty much the most uh, model-led of all the Bond films, and, and his work on both is just immaculate. Uh, particularly the uh, the finale of Moonraker with all of these space effects and the Moonraker shuttles and Drax's space station. And even the camera setups here inside M's office, when M asks where Bond is, we have a similar setup for a one-liner, and then we're introduced to Bond uh, making love to a beautiful woman. And, of course, it's exactly the same setup. But this leads us into the iconic pre-title opening, which of course had to top the uh, iconic Union Jack parachute jump and Spy Who Loved Me. So the whole notion of, uh, you know, using skydiving and being thrown up a plane without a parachute, this has never been done before and was thought impossible, would have been impossible had they not found the uh, lightweight uh, anamorphic lens to mount on the camera, which, uh, you know, they had to get a lightweight one to make it work with the uh, aerodynamics and the parachute opening for the cameraman. But uh, even with that involved, it took something about uh, 85 to 88 jumps just to get all of the footage for the sequence. And it's beautifully edited and blended and still holds up because, of course, it's all done for real. I should also mention, you can definitely tell this was the first Dolby Stereo Bond because the sound is definitely much more of a key element here. And in this moment here, when you see Bond go out of the plane and you see that it is Jaws who threw him out, this is where, you know, the audience's breath caught in their throats in 1979. And this is still one of the most breathtaking sequences, not just in the Bond canon, but in all of action adventure films. And... Barry knows exactly the right notes to hit and when to bring the James Bond theme in, but you can see musically he's playing with it a little bit more, and the recording style even sounds different. So it, it definitely is already playing into an otherworldly sort of feel because we see these men in free fall, which is about as outer space as you can get on, you know, while still on terrestrial Earth itself. And from this point onward, it's setting up the notion that Bond is himself going to go into space by the end of the film. 
So I think it's a nice way to sell this otherworldly atmosphere. And I think Barry picked up on that and continually hammers away at that throughout his entire score. Now, of course, the uh, studio footage of Roger and Richard Keel and the necessary inserts of the foot kicking are, you know, on studio and they don't exactly match. You know, if you want to sit there and, you know, hyper analyze, you can see the protective goggles on the skydivers. You can see the hidden parachutes, but it's so well cut together by John Glenn that none of that really matters because every shot is exactly how long it needs to be. The music editing is perfectly done, and the additional clarity brought by the Dolby Stereo process allows the sound field to be much more uh, expressive and really sell the sequence orally. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, Bond films at this time, they they did shoot VistaVision large format for the projection plates and things, but no matter what, they always still look a little bit iffy, uh, particularly in the cable car sequence later. And that's just, you know, usually natural projection. Now, this is where you see the first real instance of that sort of cartoony, goofish, uh, you know, uh, that goofiness that everybody talks about in Moonraker, that Jaws flaps his arms around when his parachute doesn't work and crashes into a circus. But I I will forget that because it does lead us nicely into Morris Bender's title sequence, which does have the sort of the silhouettes come out of the the following circus acrobats and i love that they use a shot of roger here very much like from the spy parachute but if you look this was apparently they did shoot a close-up of roger with the open parachute because he has the turtleneck and sport coat on and so they use that uh, or binder uses that to you know again he always directly translates into the title sequence now moonraker the title song is performed by shirley bassey is, I think, unquestionably one of the most underrated, if not the most underrated of all the title songs. And it's it's a beautiful, it's a ballad, of course, but it's just very haunting, very beautiful, and just uh, it, very emotional because it's done from the, um, ostensibly from the female perspective, uh, you know, so it's technically a song probably about Bond uh, instead of uh, being from Bond's perspective. And, of course, originally the idea was to get Frank Sinatra to perform the song. They did write a song, but uh, ultimately he wound up declining. And so they were kind of casting around and eventually settled on having Shirley Bassey come back. And uh, she always felt she didn't get to put her dramatic spin on it. But I think that really helps it. It's very emotional. It's a very naked vocal. I've always loved the moment there of, of the silhouette getting the stripes across as if, you know, she, the the silhouette becomes a, a not, not just a, an airplane or a jet, but a uh, a space shuttle in and of itself. But uh, there's a nice sedate quality to this song, and it's very emotional. And I think Binder picks up on that. I think this is one of his very inspired title sequences, uh, following after his great title sequence for Spy. But again, it's a very interesting, sedate way to open the film. And I think that also goes back to the notion of selling the otherworldly stuff that is to come. And it's built across the whole film and its score. And Barry was so perfectly able to really get to the core of each film in his scores, its emotions, its tonality. And I think Moonraker is one of the best examples of that while still maintaining the necessary, uh, you know, dark brassiness and the cynicism of his Bond scores. So, again, we see most of the same cast and crew return from Spy with a few little changes, which do make a difference, and I will cover those. But I have to say that of Bassey's three Bond songs, Moonraker is actually my favorite of the three, simply because it is the most emotional, uh, the most direct, and really has uh, this incredible dreamlike quality to it. And, of course... Beautiful transition into M's office, which is, of course, the classic set that was stored at Pinewood, but since the film was produced in France, was actually, uh, you know, packed up and shipped off to Paris and then rebuilt on the stages there. Uh, Of course, the film was shot in France uh, to get around the uh, extraordinarily heavy British tax laws at the time. So uh, a lot of people had become tax exiles and couldn't work in Britain, uh, which, of course, is why Guy Hamilton wound up uh, dropping out of both uh, Spy Who Loved Me and Superman uh, in the 1970s. But 
Uh, Moonraker was shot in Paris and used a lot of French personnel, both in cast and crew. And this, of course, does make a stylistic difference throughout the film. There is a richness throughout the film, but it definitely feels and looks different. And I think that is absolutely down to the fact that it was completely shot in France. And it was such a large production, they wound up using almost every available soundstage in Paris at the time, which, uh, much to the consternation of other people trying to make French films. Uh, And they were spread across three studios. So this was a a mammoth production, uh, an even greater scale than what had happened on The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, there were some things done at Pinewood. They did do a num- uh, most of the special effects shots uh, with Derek Mendings and his crew there, and uh, they did have to import over some of the Pinewood staff for some of Ken Adams' particularly, uh, you know, spectacular designs, uh, particularly on, on some of his showstopper sets that come up later. Uh, but it is funny to think they literally just packed up M's office and shipped it over to Paris. Now, uh, that being the main difference, I think that getting into the few little crew differences is important because uh, the film was written by Christopher Wood, uh, solo this time. Tom Makewitz did apparently do some of the original work in uh, sort of setting up the screenplay, but, you know, he, he admitted he just... He did a little uh, speculative work at the beginning to figure out how they could, you know, go from the Moonraker novel into, uh, you know, the the story that the film takes up and essentially doing Spy Who Loved Me 2.0. Uh, but, you know, after that, he just he just quietly dropped out. And uh, Spy is co-credited to Richard Maybaum, who did a really interesting draft that was discarded and did some rewriting. And Tom Makewist did some uncredited rewriting of the dialogue and Spy as well. Well, on Moonraker, you don't have any of that. So that is a major difference right there. And that's not to disparage Christopher Wood at all, who does some really amazing work. Uh, and his novelizations of both Spy and Moonraker are complete Fleming pastiches and much darker, much more serious than the films uh, turned out to be. So it's really interesting to note that the writer of the film that is viewed as the silliest and the most cartoonish wrote what are the best Fleming pastiches that anybody has ever done. And I I cannot recommend those novels uh, highly enough, uh, but uh, they are very hard to come by. But it's really interesting to read a sort of Fleming version of the Moonraker film story. But um, I, I think the biggest issue is that after the, after the success of Spy, everyone just sort of relaxed and they went over to France and things just got bigger and bigger and the budget sort of it got larger and larger. And then eventually, as I said before, the film wound up costing about uh, $33 million, which everybody, most especially Cubby Broccoli, realized you know it, it got a little bit too rich. And so going back to the notion of using food as an analogy, which is surprisingly an interesting thing to do for films... Um, by the way, I have to mention the overhead shot there of the Moonraker plant is, of course, a model. Uh, the model work in, in Moonraker and Spy as well, but Moonraker especially, uh, goes to elaborate lengths and is all flawless. So uh, Derek Mendings not only had his work cut out for him, he surpassed himself yet again. But uh, to go for a food analogy, Moonraker is much like a very rich multi-course meal that's, you know, very, very delicious, very high calorie, maybe, maybe not the healthiest thing for you, but uh, it's an enjoyable experience, but say not as, it's not always going to be as satisfying as, uh, you know, uh, something much more uh, meager, which you could maybe compare that to the uh, much more realistic and grounded, serious spy thrillers and the direct Fleming adaptations of, say, your From Rush With Love and On Majesty's Secret Service. So Moonraker perhaps represents the uh, greatest example of the antithesis to the uh, two-fisted, down-to-earth approach to Bond. And of course, everyone recognized this, and so the next film was a concentrated effort to literally do that, to get back to the From Russia With Love style in For Your Eyes Only. Uh, Not to mention sort of curb the budget a little bit, because uh, no one really wanted to um, wind up spending... Uh, over double what they spent on Spy on Moonraker. But again, every cent shows on the screen. And all of it does build character and the Drax empire we are introduced to. And this is an interesting way of also doing uh, a chunk of the Moonraker novel, which the film doesn't get credit for ever. Uh, We get the same Drax lives in this mansion estate, and we have the 
a female character inside the house itself uh, in the Corinne character, sort of taking the place of the Galibrand character in the book, who, of course, uh, winds up switching allegiances. I've always loved the way that Drax is introduced here, played by the wonderful Michel Lonsdale, and he's playing Chopin, but the way he's playing it, and he's lost in his own world, and the camera pull back and swirl around, and Bond has to wait for a moment for Drax to deign to approach him. But unlike Stromberg, he actually shakes hands. Uh, of course, Drax in the film is very much, you know, almost identical to Stromberg in terms of his plot, his goals, the fact that he's a, you know, a man richer than, you know, <laughs> the entire world's population and has his own ideas and decides to reshape the world in his own image. But it, it actually builds and develops on that idea much more. So Drax becomes a much more satisfying character because there's a sense of richness and even the dialogue, all of the wonderful put-downs he comes up with here, he's paraphrasing Oscar Wilde and talking about the loss of his Moonraker shuttles, uh, which, you know, it, 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 it's more than what we got from, from Stromberg, whose plot, of course, was to instigate World War III to cause the human race to destroy itself so then he could uh, make everyone live under the sea in safety and ostensibly rule over them. Here, Drax's plan... Uh, ultimately is to uh, not just start World War III, but to eliminate the human race and reshape the world in his own image. But uh, it goes a little bit further than that. And Lonsdale takes the the laid-back villain idea and really transforms it a little bit and, and makes it almost a, a man who's so rich that he's become sort of bored with the world at large. And so in a way to perhaps not only seek amusement, but also to get something out of life, he's decided to remake life in his own image, uh, which is a really interesting complex idea and perhaps i've just seen this film far too many times but there's also a great deliciousness in the way that he plays with every scene and the traditional back and forth bond villain uh in polite and out of polite society struggle of course we're also introduced to bond meeting drax much earlier than we are in spy which i do think enhances the drama and we get the whole uh villain facade out of the way very very quickly because as soon as bond leaves i mean we we already can tell that drax is the film but this scene here when we get the classic look after mr bond see that some harm comes to him is the villain reveal of the film and it's very very quick as soon as we're introduced to drax so it's getting to that point uh, much quicker than uh we do in spy which i do think helps build the drama much more quickly and, of course, I have to mention that, of course, is uh, Corinne Dufour, played by the wonderful French actress uh, Corinne Telly. And uh, she is the sacrificial lamb of the film. And uh, we are now with Holly Goodhead, played by Louis Childs, who not only is the gala brand of the film with the sort of cold facade for Bond to break through, and she is the uh, double agent, uh, of course, in the novel gala works for... Uh, the special branch of MI5. Here she's a CIA agent as Holly. So it, it's it's sort of they did create two female characters to take the place of the one from Fleming's novel. But there's a bunch of little interesting things from the novel that do kind of pop up in the film. It doesn't completely ignore the novel, but uh, the novel is much more uh, locked away to England and much more straightforward and much more realistic but um, it is interesting to note the, the few little bits and bobs that pop up for uh, the film adaptation. And Holly in the film is very much Triple X the second. She literally has almost the exact same character arc as Triple X, just without the murdered lover. And Roger gets to have fun doing the whole battle of the sexes thing, trying to puncture her standoffish front. Uh, of course, at this point, you know, he doesn't know that she's a CIA agent, but uh, even when that's out of the way, it makes the sort of uh, jockeying for position back and forth between the two. Uh, it gives it another edge because they're both uh, competing agents, uh, but which again is a lift from Spy. 
And in the spy trek, I mentioned how I feel spy is pretty much the gold finger of the 70s, not just because it's Roger's third film, but because it uh, successfully gained a new audience share and was the most successful to that point of the decade. And that's how Goldfinger was in the 60s. So the next film was more expensive, had literally everything thrown at it, and was the most successful film in the series until that time. You could be talking about Thunderball or Moonraker at this point. Uh, So Moonraker has a lot of Thunderball connections, and the most obvious is here at the Centrifuge, which is literally a space-age reworking of the traction table from Thunderball. But... It's so brilliantly constructed and edited that it, it, it has more layers than the traction table does, which is over pretty quickly. Uh, but we do see Bond in a similar near-death scenario. Now, the line here about a 70-year-old can take 3Gs I've always felt is probably uh, an in-joke about, you know, everybody at this point was already talking about Roger's advanced age, which, of course, uh, everybody talks about on A Few to a Kill when he was 57. So I've always thought that was probably a a winking line and all the criticism of Roger already being, you know, a slightly older Bond in 1979. So there is there is a great deal of cleverness throughout the film. It's not not the the embarrassment people pretend it is or allude it to being. They'll always poke uh, you know bemoan the cartoonish elements. But this scene in particular, the way that Cha comes in, we already see he sabotaged the centrifuge, and it builds slowly. And John Barry's score is highlighting the element of danger that's starting to build, and then it drops out, and then we're brought into the sound of the centrifuge itself starting up. And then we hear the the slight pings of the heart monitor. And it starts to build, and we get to the point of where, you know, okay, this is just Bond in a centrifuge trainer, and he's going to let go of the chicken switch at about 7 Gs. And that's when the danger kicks in. But we know it's coming, and so we wait for that point of the danger cutoff, and then when that doesn't work, that's when everything really ramps up. This is also a scene, uh, perhaps the number one scene, that definitely shows off the Dolby Stereo process being used on Moonraker because from a sound perspective, this is brilliantly constructed because a lot of films around this time period, it was very early for Dolby Stereo, and most films were not very well mixed in it, particularly in the first couple years. But Moonraker has done very well. And this scene in particular, every time the centrifuge comes around uh, at the listener center of the screen, the way it echoes around and it swoops behind the listening position, uh, because they only had one mono channel in the rears to deal with. It is really well done. And that combined with the rhythm of the editing, the rhythm of the sound increasing and in pacing as it goes on, and Roger's performance, because his face is being blown by heavy air cannons, so it was a very painful experience. Uh, he's really, this sequence sells itself so well, and it's capped off by the way that Cha starts to grin malevolently. And then his bond starts to pass out when he flashes to Q demonstrating the gadget. The little flashes into that as if it's the memory itself hazy as bond is on the edge of consciousness and death. And then as soon as the armor piercing head hits, that's when the explosion goes off. John Barry's Q comes right in with this desperate quality. And bond is barely, barely alive at this point, And Cha is just crestfallen. And then we get that nice bit of string as we see the car come to a stop and Bond's head is just lolling around. And then when he gets out, the fact that Roger allows to show Bond's near-death quality, you see this smoke coming out uh, of, the, of the console. And then he comes out and he latches onto the wall. He's barely able to move and really recognize that things have stopped moving. So it really sells the danger, and it's one of the great moments where we see Bond in mortal peril, and he has to rely on a Q gadget demonstrated uh, you know, earlier on that had been set up to get himself out of it. We get that lovely moment of Bond and Cha exchanging that glance as Cha walks off, so setting that menace there because Cha will be a recurring figure and, of course, as always, setting up their eventual confrontation. 
Now, this becomes the classical scene of Bond using his greatest weapon, which, of course, is his charm, and trying to seduce Corinne to get information out of her. And, of course, we've seen this type of scene before, but it's played so beautifully, and I think I should take a moment here to talk about one of the other great differences that sets Moonraker apart. Uh, Originally, the film would have been shot by the cinematographer Claude Renoir, who shot The Spy Who Loved Me, but unfortunately, uh, he had to step out because of failing eyesight, uh, which... Uh, cut his career short really Uh, he wound up retiring uh, shortly around this time period so the film was actually photographed by Jean Tournier who had photographed uh, John Frankenheimer's The Train and the fantastic film Day of the Jackal directed by Fred Zinneman which also starred Michel Lonsdale ironically Roger Moore wanted to star in that film as the Jackal but was rejected (laughs) because he was too viewed as Bond by that point but what Trinier does visually, uh, he does use some zoom lenses. You see a little bit of that there in the shot where they move in closer to them as they go on the bed, uh, as Renoir did on Spy. But there's a, a, a richness in the visuals as well. Uh, there is a little bit of a contrasty look at times, but particularly the close-ups, especially the actress close-ups, when Corinne lays her head there on, uh, back on the pillow, um, the close-ups of the actors in this film are just beautifully done and composed and lit. Uh, the film is beautifully lit, and it's very full of grandeur throughout, which goes it goes again to the notion I like to talk about of Moonraker having this great richness to it. Uh, so it, it is a, a beautifully made film. It is definitely a film that shows its budget in every scene and sense. And then you have Ken Adam returning to his what would unfortunately be his last Bond film. And uh, again, having the ability to go bigger and better than what he did on Spy. And everybody talks about the great showstopper Ken Adam sets up, which Moonraker has, you know, a great many. But he was not just one of the great production designers for his showstopper sets. His smaller sets are just as exquisitely designed here in Drax's office. Uh, you know, the, just the, the, the setup is just as well done as any of Adam's other sets. So I feel his other work, you know, outside of the classic villain layers and his, uh, you know, game changer sets are, um, I feel his, his, you know, for lack of a better term, his smaller sets uh, usually get glossed over, but it's all an important part of what he brought to the Bond films. And Moonraker would be the last time he worked for uh, a film on the series. This being a, a lovely Q gadget, the safe cracker X-ray device hidden inside the cigarette case, and got to mention, I've always wondered when uh, Bond talks about, you know, when he shows Corinne the case, you, know, you have a heart of gold. Does she realize that it's an X-ray safe cracker? <laughs> you know, and she just looks over. She's like, "What are you doing?" And then he says, "Oh, you have a heart of gold, 18 carat." Um, so did did she know that that's a safe cracker or just a cigarette case? But there's something about this scene, uh, the way that Bond and Corinne have this nicely developed relationship. She's not in the film for very long, but it adds to the fact, uh, to the audience response when she is, you know, killed in the next sequence, and it's she becomes one of the most effective sacrificial lambs in the series. I have to mention here, uh, Bond having the spy camera is great, but having the 007 over the actual lens is where the film does one of the moments where it just goes one little step too far. It's just, it's a little bit too much. It's like the double taking pigeon, which we'll get to much later on. The The thing about Moonraker is it has its richness, but it does have some moments where they, they push it a little too far and it, it goes a little too goofy. But then you go right back into moments like this where Barry's strings just come in with a version of the title theme, which is used in all the love sequences. The love sequences are so wonderfully, there's a tender quality to all of them, particularly every time, you know, Bond leaves in the, in the, in the dark of the night after, you know, the, the passionate night spent together. And then I've loved the, always loved the moment here because they're, spied on by Cha, who is revealed in the darkness. As soon as he's revealed, Barry's score has that nice dramatic side come in. Bond thinks he's escaped. Notice, and we see Cha in the darkness, 
watching them with all the malevolence of a murderer. And then we get a nice transition cut into the grouse hunting scene. Uh, Moonraker was edited by John Glenn, just as he did on Spy. So there's a number of really great editing transitions, uh, like I pointed out in Spy. So I'll try and point some of those out as well. And it's interesting as well. Spy runs about a minute longer than, I'm sorry, Moonraker runs about a minute longer than Spy at two hours, six minutes, but it feels much longer. Um, There is a more sedate quality, and I think that, again, goes to the sort of richness that I talk about in in Moonraker. So it's a film that feels much longer than it is. Uh, I think that's also because some of the rhythms of the dialogue are, 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 are a bit not lackadaisical, but they're they're definitely richer and slower. Um, so it, it feels more like it's, you know, two and a half hours sometimes, but it is well edited. But, you know, there's th- th- nothing more that John Glenn can do in the editing room to, you know, say, pick up the pace. Um, but I think that's because it's such a rich film. I have to point out when Bond appears, if you pay attention, the bugler plays the first three notes of the Zarathustra music, which, of course, 2001 was the famous science fiction film. So just as Spy made a number of uh, music illusions, we have a classical piece in both Spy and Moonraker when the villain is introduced. Uh, We have many usages of movie music. So there we just had a reference to 2001. Uh, We saw the second appearance of Drax pointing out lovely ladies who are accompanying him, all of whom will turn up as part of his Noah's Ark project. So we see that dialed in. And of course, you won't know their significance to the film at this point. Now, this is one of the great scenes of the film, like the centrifuge, and both I point out to people who insist that Rogers Bond is too cute, too much like the saint, and too light to be an effective James Bond. Here, Bond is set up to be killed in what could be easily explained as an accident, and in a split second, realizes the trap and is able to take out the would-be sniper. We get the wonderful reveal, you miss Mr. Bond, the body falls out, and then Roger's delivery of, did I? As you said, such good sport. Also loved how, always loved how the wind was blowing his hair a little bit in that take, almost give, accentuating the inherent flippant quality of that line. And then Drax has that sort of crestfallen look, which sets up the line much later on, you defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you, Mr. Bond. So it's a wonderful setup. And then that immediately, Bond wins, goes off, and then we get Drax almost going overboard and exacting his revenge on Corinne. And this is perhaps the most agonizing of all the deaths in the series because it's haunting, and it's a character we've come to appreciate and like, and she is horribly killed by Drax's pet Dobermans. And John Barry's score here, when it starts with the first tingling notes, as if it's the first intonation in Corinne's brain that she is not long for this world. And then everybody screams, don't run into the woods. And she's even in high heels, so she has literally no chance. And this allows the horror to build. We almost see Drax... The way he looms over the camera, uh, you know, the last shot we see of him is very, very striking. And, of course, they're, you know, watching and waiting for her to be torn to ribbons. But the, it all, this whole sequence allows her terror to build. It has that otherworldly quality in the light coming through the trees and the crashing through the leaves. And her terror becomes extreme. And it's all compounded by John Barry's score and then he starts bringing in the little stings right before she falls and then when she finally falls we see we actually see dogs hit the stunt woman and then we hear the chimes of the bells before we cut to Venice and then when we cut to Venice we get a live chime as the arm strikes the bell so it's a really well done editing transition by John Glenn there. One I've always loved that gets us right from what is ostensibly California into Venice. 
and that's something that's very difficult to do, and uh, you don't see executed in films very much anymore, uh, particularly very well. It's almost always a cut and a location card. Uh, so th- thankfully, in a film as well-made as Moonraker, that is something that is properly executed. So here we see another gorgeous lady in the Drax Terrestrial Empire, who of course will reappear as one of the uh, Drax Noah's Ark participants. So we see all of these lovely faces throughout the film, and you know they always look at Bond in a duplicitous way, as she does here. We get a, a, another use of zoom lens there, and uh, again, they will all reappear by the climax. So this, of course, is the actual uh, Venetian glassworks. Uh, and of course, the production globe trotted all over the place. So uh, oftentimes, Bond will uh, be in one location, go through a doorway, and be somewhere completely different, the glassworks being on a actual island uh, in and of itself. And then you know the outer facility being in uh, Venice off of uh, you know, St. Mark's Square. And everybody talks about Moonraker being the science fiction one and the one with laser guns and the one where they go into space at the end and Jaws gets a girlfriend and all that stuff. But if you look at it, you know, the majority of the film is rather down to earth. Bond is right now doing spying work, uh, which he doesn't always do in the films. Um, So when you look at Moonraker seriously, you know, the vast majority of it is Bond doing his job and doing detective work and having a lavish time doing so, you know, uh, because, you know, Bollinger Champagne is not always in detective work. But it, it has a style in and of itself. And while it is very much built around the formula they had established on The Spy Who Loved Me, uh, again, you see the museum tour guide here. I always love how she sort of pauses when she, I guess, when she's supposedly seeing Bond, uh, you know, it, it, she will pop up later. So every time the camera lingers on someone in the Drax organization, they're going to have an important role or pop up again at the end on the shuttles. I like how Bond tails Holly around, and this sets up later how Bond will be investigating at night and find the uh, secret research laboratory. Now that he's tailed her, and I love how he just appears in front of her, and I love the camera pullback when we have the 14th century. And then Bond does the whole mock Dr. Goodhead, and we get another scene where they have this duplicitous byplay back and forth and while Bond's dialogue could maybe come across as a bit uh you know stiff and a bit for for lack of a better term uh you know a a bit nasty it's Roger's performance and the way it's written you can tell that Bond for some reason is trying to uh once again permeate the cold front that Holly has put up and either try and get some information or uh, trying to charm her to get information out of her as he did with Corinne earlier on. And of course, later on in the next time they meet, uh, Bond will know that she's a CIA agent. But this sort of back and forth pointed banter is the entire nature of their relationship in the film. Whereas Spy, there was a greater... um, romantic quality that developed here at Moonraker you don't get that so it does help differentiate uh doing the same sort of uh agent and agent relationship male female bickering that they did in Spy and uh just it gives it a slightly different quality so they're not doing the exact same thing again and this of course becomes the failed uh, attempt to kill Bond in a super elaborate way where they have uh, a guy hidden in the <laughs> in the casket with a million knives of different lengths and varieties. It's a wonderful idea. It is completely nonsensical, but uh, you know it, it, it could work. Uh, but this becomes the chase uh, by a speedboat and motorized gondola down the Venetian uh, Venetian waters. Now, originally, Christopher Wood wanted to have a motorbike chase across the bridges, but uh, they had a hard enough time getting permits that uh, that was not allowed, so they were able to develop this sequence, which, honestly, it works. And although the setup is a little goofy, it's just plausible enough that had 
MI6 had a Venetian office that they would have felt the need to somehow motorize a gondola for a quick getaway. It's just ridiculous, slightly ridiculous and plausible enough. And then we get this nice bit where the actual speedboat comes tearing around. And of course, in Venice, there's a strict speed limit. So it was very difficult to get these permits. And it's just plausible enough and just fantastic enough to have a speed chase through Venice. Um, again, John Barry's score kicks in. And again, you can tell this is Dolby Stereo because the bullets sort of ricochet around to a much greater degree than what they would have uh, earlier on. But there's, there's a nice sort of uh, element of danger in this sequence works, and it doesn't get the credit for it because everybody remembers the end of the sequence when we get the gondola turning into the hovercraft and going across St. Mark's Square. So here we have the little bit of inherent comedy, as most Bond chases have, with uh, the gondola getting cut in half and the lovers going on blissfully unaware which, of course, is sort of lifting an idea from splitting the boat and the man with the golden guns uh, chase through the uh, Klongs in Bangkok. So, of course, now Bond is trying to escape, gets to St. Mark's Square, and this became the moment where Roger was publicly humiliated five times because every time they did this, the gondola hovercraft would not properly go out of the water and would flip over and dunk him in the water, and he'd have to go get changed, and luckily they had just enough suits uh, that he was able to get it on the sixth take. And then they literally did this in the square packed with tourists, just put a little horn on, and basically expanded the entirety of the wet Nelly coming out on the beach in Spy. We had the reappearance of the extra doing the double take at what he's drinking, and there's the infamous double taking pigeon, which is a, I suppose it was maybe John Glenn because it's editing, um, but... You know, this sequence gets a lot of vitriol, but it's well cut, and we get the extra bit with the music being cut to the uh, hapless Drax associate getting thrown out of the speedboat. It's over so quick, and it's so rich, and it's done for real. You know, you have to admire it in a strange way. It is a bit over the top. No secret agent would really do that, but... um, Really, the only thing I find a, a fault with is that double taking pigeon. That's that's where it's like it's it's it. That's the moment where it crosses over and it's it goes from being a fun, lighthearted joke and it just becomes a bit much. It goes a bit too goofy. Um, but that being said, it does it. It's over really quickly, and then we immediately go into Bond uh, breaking into the Drax facility at night. Of course, he has the classical black outfit, but the 1979 version which is iconic in and of its own way with the large collar and open shirt but this is a very serious sequence and so you know, several people die in this sequence bond nearly dies several times and again he's having to do detective work you know here he has to see how to get the actual code to enter and of course in a blink and you miss it but fantastic gag also referencing other films and another space film the way they get into the lab, the key code is the iconic five-note theme uh, from the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which, of course, came out two years before in 1977. Uh, of course, when I saw Moonraker as a kid nine million times, I had not yet seen Close Encounters, so when I saw Close Encounters, I thought they had stolen the notes from Moonraker, not realizing it was the other way around. Uh, that's a wonderful little gag, and it's one of those I absolutely adore. It's just, it's just enough of a wink without, you know, being too much. So this becomes Bond seeing the full uh, weaponized part of Drax's plan for the first time. But of course, Bond and we, the audience at this point, have no idea what is going on. I have to again mention the genius of Ken Adams' design. Uh, this is, you know, taking place in a beautiful, real historical location that they had to, again, worry about the permits and they couldn't go too crazy with it. And the next time we see this, all of this will be removed. We see the actual location and it becomes Drax's office and a really nice dramatic reveal. But to think that they then built all of this inside that and it is exactly the same as we see fully realized in the Drax facility uh, at the end of the film and the space station uh, combined with the 
the steel that uh, stainless steel that Ken Adam used in The Spy Who Loved Me, but it's done differently. We see all the uses of glass, all of the uh, circular elements. It actually advances on what he did on his spy design, I think, beautifully. And I've always thought that John Barry's cue here is so perfect at selling the seriousness of this, because at this point we don't know that this is a toxic nerve agent. We know it's something serious. And of course, Bond just slips the tube in his shirt. And so uh, throughout the entirety of the, the fight to come, it's like, how in the heck does the most important piece of glass not break in that tiny vial? And of course, Bond setting down the vial there sets up that the uh, two scientists meet their untimely end, which shows us that that stuff is poison. So we get all this without any exposition, because uh, it's always better to see and not explain. And, you know, they you could maybe say that they go a little over the top in their death scenes, but it does really sell this, the look on their faces and uh, the, 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 the alarm chime going off the door blowing over with the radioactive symbol, the seal coming through the door, and John Barry's score hitting those notes to really sell it as the guy horribly goes down the glass with his hands and everything. And then Bond just stares on, only able to watch as this unfolds with his only company, the Screeching Lab Rats. which, of course, led to the soundtrack cue being labeled uh, Bond Smells Rat. Now, this is the big John Glenn jump scare of the film. Uh, John Glenn is well known for his jump scares, particularly with animals, in the 1980s Bond films he directed. But he started introducing the jump scares in The Spy Who Loved Me when he started editing. So uh, you have Jaws on the train there. Here you have Cha coming out uh, out of nowhere and this is one of the major jump scares of the series but this is a really wonderful fight and cha really goes for broke and you can tell just how much he wants to kill bond which helps sell the sequence the gag being that they showed the glass exhibit earlier on and they destroy every single thing in it so yeah it's a bit childish to do that but it's a hell of a lot of fun because we now see the glass handle sword that was set up, and now Bond is able to dispatch Cha's weapon, get the temporary advantage, get the lovely reaction shot, and then Bond gets a toy with him a little bit, get a little Oz in of his own. So this is a, actually a pretty gritty fight. It's not lauded as such, but it should be. And you get the added fun of literally breaking everything in the room. Here you get the million dollar bowl with the alarm on it. Bond carefully sets it down to preserve artistic history, and then Chaw just smashes it. So, <laughs> again, it, humor is a necessary element of Bond films, and inherent humor is beautiful. So, it's stuff like this that's the Bond humor that the series is known for. And the problem, the only thing you can say that's a problem in Moonraker is that sometimes. They just went a little too far. That doesn't make the film bad, though, and it's unfortunate that some people just immediately latch on to it, uh, being from the 70s, being post-Star Wars, and having laser guns and some cartoony stuff in it, that they immediately then think the whole film is like that and don't give it a chance because, like I said, the vast majority of the film is quite grounded, and this fight scene in particular, when Cha jumps down here with the train, with the chain in his hands, Again, that's another Jonglin jump scare, and Bond got a moment to spy the label on the box, Rio de Janeiro, which is how he knows to go to Rio later on, and you see the box smashes open, and we see one of the globes poking out. So Bond has seen the globes with the nerve vials inside them. Now he's seen them inside the boxes getting shipped out to Rio. So even though he's fighting for his life, he's still piecing everything together, and this is how we are able to transition to Rio. Now, climbing up here, Cha still has the chain. He still is a worthy adversary, and I love the dramatic quality of the blue lighting. And then we're shown the the gag of how Cha will be eliminated. Now, the opera is being performed, and the voice starts to come through back into the location as it rises to the most dramatic point. Cha goes through the window, 
We don't see him hit the piano. We hear it. That's even more effective. And then the one-liner is one of my favorite one-liners in the series because it is an in-joke for film nerds. Play it again, Sam, being the line from Casablanca everybody quotes that is never used in the film. And it's one of the great lines that everybody knows. And so I've always loved that Bond uses a Casablanca reference finally in the series. Now, Holly going outside on her balcony is setting up the fact that Bond has actually broken into her room, which is why this jump scare is here. It is a little weird how Bond is just there and why he decides to surprise her that way, ostensibly knowing that she's a CIA agent. But I love the way that they play this. Roger has this bemused look because, of course, he's just fought for his life. I love the line, girlfriend charge tried to kill me. But... He is going to shortly uh, expose Holly's identity as a CIA agent so that way they can drop the facade. And the line about friends in low places is sensibly meaning that he got the information about her real employer from Felix Leiter. I do enjoy the fact that Bond, I guess, steals Holly's poison pen and eventually uses it to kill the python, being one of the few times he uses a non-Q branch gadget to get out of a sticky situation. I do like how Bond uses every single gadget that Holly has to eventually, you know, rub it in. And then the line about Bollinger and uh, if it's 69, you were expecting me that I did not get that as a kid for the longest time. And I suppose that is a holdover of Tom Minkowitz style dialogue. And I've always wondered that line and the iconic uh, final Q line that those have always felt like uh, Tom Mankiewicz lines, but uh, ostensibly they're not. But they are in that Tom Mankiewicz style of the innuendo, blinking you miss it, biting one-liners. So Bond has dismantled Holly's entire arsenal, and it's funny. Why would she go? Why would she need a flamethrower? <laughs> um, you know, and all this other stuff. But uh, you know, I guess it's as Bond says, standard equipment. And this becomes the point at which the romance of the two is brought in, but here it is played for each one trying to get their own aims. So it's a romance not of romance, but a romance out of uh, necessity. And I do like the sort of classical, classic Hollywood battle of the sexes thing where they're talking at opposite ends. Bond sees her plane ticket for Rio in the drawer and she looks at her packed luggage over behind Bond's shoulder and they play this little charade out even though they both know that they're flying through their teeth which makes the scene have this nice inherent humor to it but again if you look at the beauty of the photography how close they are and they immediately go in for another embrace and John Barry's just exquisite music it really sells the tenderness and then here again bond leaves the lady in the dark of the night and he slips out alone into the darkness as bond always does because bond is always alone this little moment here is one of my favorite moments in the whole series simply due to the the tenderness of it the dark tone and Bond leaving alone. And then Holly immediately calls for the porter to then leave. So again, selling that idea of they've just had this romantic night together and uh, she's going to leave, ostensibly she thinks, leave Bond in the dust. Now, Bond brings in M and Freddie Gray for some reason to go in on the sting operation to raid the laboratory. I do like the bit here. You see uh, Drax's secretary try and head them off for a second. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of curious why M and Freddie Gray needed to come in on this, but, uh, they're here anyway. This is to set up the fact that Bond is going to be humiliated and, uh, ostensibly be thrown off the case because Freddie is humiliated. Now it is uh, also interesting to see Bond and Freddie and M in gas mass. But, uh, if you look very closely, uh, I know I said something about Roger's age before, which I don't think is an issue at all. But if you look, when he takes off the gas mask, you can see his hair and his makeup is a little must because they didn't get to do it again. If you look very closely, you see more of his for your eyes only octopusy look here in this shot. Uh, then, and then immediately 
in the next shot when you see him again he's got the the hair perfectly done and the makeup done so it's it's interesting uh you know actors age over time of course and you can't disguise that but uh, i've seen this film so many times and i've noticed roger's differing hairstyles and makeup and thing makeup and things um that i've always thought that was funny because he takes the gas mask off and suddenly he looks more like for your eyes only era um and of course freddie has to apologize and there was the lovely line slightly before about uh, where Freddie says, I play bridge with this fellow Drax, which, of course, alludes to the bridge sequence with Drax in the novel. Now, this is a great moment for Bond and M. Bond has ostensibly screwed up but and is being, you know, fired off the job. But uh, Bond provides the nerve vial, gives it to M, who ostensibly has to fly back to MI6 on a plane with a vial of nerve gas with him. But the way that Bond and M talk and M thinks about it for a second, how he can sell this, says, you need to take a leave of absence. Any thoughts where you might might go? I've always had a hankering of uh, going to Rio, sir. I think I can recall you mentioning it. And the slight smile that comes over Bernard Lee's face. It's just beautiful. And then they both walk off into the distance and yeah, back into their separate realms. It's a nice moment of spycraft there. I've always enjoyed that scene, and it's one of the best of the paternal moments we get with uh, Bond and M in the original films. And Moonraker, of course, was the last film that Bernard Lee played M in, so there's a certain poignancy I've always felt there, uh, because, of course, he would pass away before he was able to complete his role for Four Years Only. So now that Cha has been eliminated, we have the great moment of Drax calling, I guess, 1-800-Henchman. And, uh, oh, if you can get him, of course. And now we're reintroduced to Jaws. And this scene is cute, Jaws going through the metal detector. It's a little goofy, but it's just cute enough. Now, Bond arrives to Rio here. This moment in Barry's score is the most stereo separation you get. It's really expansive. And Bond, of course, arrives on Concord. This is actually the shot of Roger Moore arriving because he had actually been taken ill with kidney stones. And so it, it caused some delays and uh, they had to wait and fly him from Paris on the Concorde. And then they literally just filmed <laughs> Roger's plane landing, which I find absolutely hilarious. I love Bond's outfit. They have Roger in here, the sort of cream suit with the open neck. And of course, he's uh, being followed by somebody taking photos who's revealed to be Manuela. But it's just a nice little sequence that suggests some spy craft, suggests a little bit of uh, maybe Bond arriving in Istanbul and from Russia with Love. So again, there are some little moments of spy craft in Moonraker. And it's about darn time that people realize that, uh, you know, the movie's actually pretty serious up to a point and, you know, relatively grounded up until, uh, you know, Jaws comes in and some of the cartoony elements really start to take off in the second half. And of course, when Roger turns around to the hotelier and, and does the really, it's one of the most often used moments for uh, Bond compilation trailers and things. And now we get the lovely reveal of Manuela and of course, she being the same person that uh, tailed Bond from the airport. And then the nice little bit in the dialogue, if you pay attention, that uh, she is, you know, an agent of the MI6 branch in Rio. But of course, since Bond is technically off the assignment, M has surreptitiously under the table asked the local branch to assist Bond if possible, but not out of the open, which is why she did not pick up Bond from the airport. So that's that's a nice little bit that I've always enjoyed. And again, Moonraker is full of things like that, as are all Bond films. But of course, most people don't take Bond films seriously. They see them once or twice or every once in a while, and they're viewed as entertainments, which they are meant to be. But that doesn't mean that they can't be looked at seriously as art, which they also are. Of course, maybe it's a little forward of Bond to immediately uh, suggest a role in the hay, but... Roger plays it beautifully with the pulling of, of a robe sash and the line, how do you kill five hours in Rio if you don't samba? So this, of course, is the famous Rio Carnival. And what's interesting is that they actually had to go down a year before and shoot location footage and then uh, come back when they were shooting the principal photography 
and then try and match what they had shot before and actually save some of the costumes, which I find amusing, but it's actually quite brilliant because it's very difficult to photograph uh, large events like this uh, as they had that problem on Thunderball with the Junkanoo, and it caused them a lot of headaches to get all the necessary footage. Now, if you look there, that is technically Jaws, who will pop up later on. So when you see the film multiple times, you know the costume Jaws has. You notice him. You notice Bond pass. And now if you look, Jaws is following them, sees them break away, and then stops. So when we see the clown costume stop and watch, that's when we know something is not right with that one particular clown. And, of course, when you see the film a second time. And if you look in the back of the shot here, you can still see Jaws is standing there in the very far background. So again, when you see the film again, and you know that's Jaws, and now, we, now we've cut back to him, so we know, okay, that's, that clown is, is something, there's something off with that clown. And then my whale turning and seeing the cabana club there, inside of a grungy alleyway for some reason, that sets up you know how the sequence will end. But I think the way that Jaws, the, the clown, is just approaching down the alleyway is very striking. It's one of those moments, as, as a kid, when you see Moonraker, it, it has this strange, almost scary vibe to it. And, of course, Bond is poking around the empty warehouse at night. We get the nice stray cat running through. But again, this whole time, Jaws is approaching closer and closer, and obviously Manuela will be no match for him and will be killed off. Not that we have been, you know, with her longer than a minute or two, but it's just a, a, a nice moment of suspense because now we see him and he's closer and he's getting closer. And of course, first time around, you don't know that it's Jaws yet, but you know there's something menacing under that clown hood. All Bond finds inside is a logo for the Drax Air Freight, which will lead him on the trail to uh, the airport they operate out of. So, of course, meaning he's missed uh, the moving out of the warehouse. Now the clown mask comes off, and Jaws is back. And here he's actually quite menacing, as he was in Spy. Because, of course, the danger to Manuela is immense here, and he does almost get to get the bite on. And here, yeah, it's a little goofy, the fact that Jaws gets interrupted, but it's it's just plausible enough in the way he tries to pantomime it off, and he picks her up, and he sort of dances around and half smiles. And it's like, okay, leave. I gotta, I gotta do... I like killing people. Can you please leave? I can't kill people if you're watching, you know? <laughs> just, that, that, now, see, that's that's the inherent humor I'm talking about. It's It's finding ways of getting the humor in there and, again, giving Bond enough time to be able to get back. And again, he still barely arrives in time, which keeps the suspense going. And now Bond meets Jaws again, and we get a nice reprise. You get the nice weight of their meeting again. Jaws sort of pauses for a minute, is like, oh, yes, I'm going to get to kill you now. And Bond does does one final little toothy smile just to rub it in, like, oh, you again, ha-ha. And, of course, they're held back, and Jaws is frustrated, and then this is the kind of goofy way the scene ends. Jaws is led away by the crowd of people coming out. And it doesn't look like enough people to drag Jaws away, but, you know, it, it's fine enough. And I do love the fact that eventually he just gives up and starts partying. Oh, I'll kill you tomorrow. La, 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 you know. <laughs> and we get the nice payoff here of Bond and Manuela, you know, out in the alleyway. We get the exposition about Bond finds it empty. He's going to go... Uh, do a recon of the airport in the next scene and Manuel has been roughed up a bit rather dense with you and of course she needs rest and will now exit the film too <laughs> and if you look closely Bond is still in his tuxedo he's just removed the tie so this is just you know meant to be a few hours later so I guess uh you know that was late at night and Bond didn't get any sleep so I, I do like that that sort of lived in idea that uh you know Bond takes her home she almost dies. She had a rough night. And then he immediately goes to Sugarloaf Mountain to do a recon of the uh, Drax airfield. And he does take the time to remove the bow tie. So uh, he goes right from one place to another. Uh, doesn't get to sleep in his fancy hotel either. <laughs> it's 
It's interesting, of course, here uh, we, we get a nice quiet scene and of course bond is at a high elevation so it not only allows the chance to give the the give the audience a breather but it does set up the scene that will come with the fact that uh bond will be bond and holly will be stranded on the cable car at the great height so it's already setting up the idea that bond is at a great height you hear the slight wind and of course now we see the plane and then we cut into uh you know probably couldn't do that with the uh you know visitor telescope zoom in that close but we see the drax air freight so we know that the planes are going out and then we pick up holly in the other telescope and then i'm sure this must be a gag but i've always thought it amusing that bond walks away walks over to her but pushes the telescope upwards so of course it's pointing upwards which is obviously phallic uh and then the the lovely touch of he puts her hand puts his hand over hers you know face is familiar as is the manner so now we have the total dropping of the uh, facade and the lines about you know tripping over your luggage over the, out the door, and this is the last point where they're doing the sort of jockeying. Here they're starting to act more like uh, parallel you know agents on the same case, and the cable car fight will be the point at which Holly feels Bond has saved her life and will now stop fighting him the whole way. Uh, and of course, you know, then she'll get captured and then, you know, exit the film for a while only to reappear when Bond arrives at the Drax base. But that's what makes the cable car scene important for a character perspective, because not only is it bringing Jaws back into the picture, not only is it getting Bond in a stranded location where he can't get away, which is why, you know, if Jaws was thwarted before, he's like, okay, now we're going to get you in a place where you can't run away, so then I can kill you. Because that's all he really wants to do in life <laughs> at this point. And you would think that he could just stop the cable car. I've always wondered why he, they, they have Jaws, you know, cut through with his teeth on the cable. Um, but I guess that's to somehow prevent the car from starting again. Although you can't start it from inside the cable. Car. Yeah, it's, it, I've never quite understood why they have to break the cable as well. Other than it launches Bond onto a precarious point where he's hanging for his life. Now, this, of course, all the location footage is done for real with stunt people, and it is fantastic. But, of course, again, as I said in the pre-title sequence, you know, as good as they did with the, using VistaVision for the background plates, it just never quite matches up and looks very much like projection plates when uh, in this sequence particularly. But then the location footage with the stunt people is just riveting, and that is really them up there in a very precarious position, you know, doing this for real, which also helps to sell any sequence, and that is something you don't get anymore. The fact that these are, you know, real stunt people out there without any uh, CGI assistance either. So this does give a nice dramatic buildup, Jaws coming up, and then Bond and Holly going down, having that nice bit of dialogue, again, slightly like Spy, but building up the meeting. Bond saying, I might have guessed. Holly says, you know him. <laughs> and then Jaws looks on with such anticipation. And then we get the long shot here, which is wonderfully done. And then we see them come together, and then right when they meet, that's when they're stopped. You get the nice swaying of the cars, which they do match in studio. So they did it as, as good as they could. But for some reason, uh, particularly in, in the films of this era, there's something about the projection work in studio that doesn't quite match as well. And this, unfortunately, the staging of this fight is a little goofy because it's such a confined space and it's over so quickly there's not much you can do, so it's not as a, anywhere near as effective as the train fight in Spy with Jaws. But again, the location work is really fantastic, and John Barry's cue is very well done. Again, there you have the signature Roger move of, of grabbing onto something and then kicking out with the feet, which seems to be the signature Roger Moore Bond uh, fighting move. There it is again, and they're able to get Jaws into the cable car. So that being the goal of the fight, it's it's fine. It's over very quickly, but the more times you see Moonraker, this is one of those pieces that always sticks out as being just a little, that the choreography is, isn't quite as impressive as one would hope it would be. 
But then the escape is is well done with literally having to slide down on a chain. And then the effect shot is actually quite well done for just being a mat and then having actual stunt people doing some of the sliding on location. And then the idea of the car coming down behind them at speed, it is a really interesting death trap scenario. Of course, this is all going to be played for comedy at the end when Jaws crashes through, but again, it builds, and then the sound starts to build as well as it did in the centrifuge sequence, so it is really selling the anticipation of danger and death, so it is a really nice death trap. Jump at the last second, sound builds up further, and then, of course, Jaws' reaction is a bit on the cartoonish side. Although the work of the actual crash and miniature is beautifully done. Uh, of course, you get the 7-Up everywhere, which is the film's product placement really being a bit too obvious, which it is in a few places. And it's really the first example where the product placement becomes way too noticeable. Now, this is the point at which where the goofiness really comes into play, where we have Jaws again surviving where most people would be obliterated, but here he meets Dolly, who becomes his girlfriend, and we have the the big romantical classical cue come in, and yes, it's way too much. Yes, it's really goofy, but there's just something about it that... You know, everybody wound up loving Jaws and Spy, and, you know, he gets to have a happy moment. Um, But it is way too out of place in a Bond film. Um, But, it, you know, again, it's over very quickly. Um, Again, the something that's come up recently but has always kind of been there, the notion of everybody thinking that Dolly had braces, I think is pretty much from uh, the fact that, you know, you would think that, Jaws having a girlfriend, well, she would have metal on her teeth as well. And uh, also the fact that we were all watching Moonraker on VHS for the longest time with low resolution and her teeth could very much look like they had braces on them on, you know, old VHS copies. So, of course, apparently they had a backup plan in progress uh, in case Jaws failed. And so they've captured Bond and Holly and they're let off in an ambulance because, of course, everything Drax plans has a cover, which I do appreciate. And I actually enjoy this sequence very much. It's a very small sequence. They have to dispatch the one guy, and they're tied to gurneys. And so Bond and Holly distract him so Bond can get a hand loose and try and uh, get off the gurney and untie himself. And the way Roger smiles and when the the gurney starts moving because they're on this rough road, they're starting to go up the mountain here. It's just a wonderfully staged little sequence. There's a lot of nice drama, and Roger does the eye, the eyebrow and the wink. It's just enough, and then he's able to get to the fire extinguisher, which, you know, you could make the Diamonds Are Forever illusion, and then he's able to untie himself. We get a nice little fight, and it's close quarters, so this is the intensity we needed in the cable car fight. And there is a nice little bit of humor. Uh, and then I always love the strange bit where Holly grabs the guy's head, Bond punches him, she gets a handful of his hair. And there you see more of the product placement and all of the billboards. Psycho, Marlboro, it'll be British Airways again. There's the hair coming off. And then what I love most about this sequence is Bond essentially fails in a way because they get knocked out on the gurney. He barely rolls off. And now he's lost Holly and has to follow the trail that he's lost. He's roughed up. You hear the noise. And then I do like the fact that the man died inside the product placement. And then as Spy used the famous Lawrence of Arabia theme, here we get in a lovely transition of how Bond walks up the hill into the sun, and we get the strains of Elmer Bernstein's classic Magnificent Seven theme with Bond essentially doing another travel incognito moment as we see him on Camel and Spy. Here he is uh, almost in vaquero gear on horseback in poncho and cowboy hat with the Magnificent Seven theme. It's a beautiful moment. Uh, Again, I can totally live with using Magnificent Seven because it's just beautifully put together and John Barry rendering Elmer Bernstein is really interesting. 
So it's and it's over very quickly, and it's very interesting, I think, to see Bond not quite in disguise, but in the guise of his surroundings. So I've always appreciated little moments like that. And then this is an interesting sequence where we're seeing the cover of the MI6 local branch as we saw it hidden inside the pyramids in Spy, but here it's hidden in a monastery. And we get the little bit of the monks, uh, you know, practicing their judo in one room. And now we see Money Penny again. So again, this is taking the place of the scene in the pyramids in Spy, where we get the traditional office banter, but on location halfway through the film. And of course, Bond's gotten lost. So <laughs> go to the other courtyard. So here we get Q Lab on location once again, except here it's in the courtyard. We get uh, some interesting things demonstrated. Of course, since we're here, since we in South America, we will see Q take some of the local techniques, make the bolas explosive, and we'll also see the first appearance of the iconic Moonraker laser, which will set up the fact for the audience that the lasers will come into play so that when the lasers aren't, uh, are introduced in the end, it's not a surprise that all of a sudden we've got laser guns. And... You know, the effect for the time period is well done because, of course, all of it had to be, you know, physically put into each individual frame by hand, much like the blaster effects in Star Wars. And this will be a Q, Bond, and M uh, analyzing the sample Bond presented and how Bond will be able to follow the next link in the detective train uh, to track the, um, the actual flower, the orchid that produced the toxin and uh, its last known uh, place of origin, which will, of course, set up the boat chase. And I like here how, you know, Bond is sometimes too much of a know-it-all, but he's able to look at the chemical formula and, you know, realize that it's plant-based. And, of course, how he would know the exact backstory of that particular flower and where exactly it came from, I guess maybe he happened to uh, read the discovery or something. <laughs> um, but still, it's, it's nice that there's this had to be developed and researched, and it's still Bond following the trail, the breadcrumbs, doing detective and spy work which is always appreciated. I do like the little push-in on the map, which transitions over into the boat chase. It's a nice transition. And this, of course, is supposed to be the Amazon, but was actually shot in the Florida Everglades. And it's wonderfully atmospheric, but of course it's funny to think that suddenly we go to Florida. Uh, as I, again, I said before, Moonraker is a film where they were having to uh, you know, hop around all over the globe. And so you know, sometimes sequences change continents in, you know, uh, a single uh, dissolve transition. Bond is once again in a Glastron speedboat, uh, beautifully decked out by Q Branch. And we get the wonderful little bit of silence, and then we hear the rifle grenades coming out of nowhere to announce the Drax crew. So Bond is close on his objective, and now we see the first appearance of the iconic Drax yellow jumpsuits. But this is a nice bit of danger, and of course, it's fitting to have Rogers Bond once again behind the wheel of a Glastron jet boat. It's also fun to see the Q branch gadgets, but uh, with Bond pushing switches, it is always hearkening back to the little Nelly chase where Bond is just pushing buttons instead of, you know, throwing a car around to knock other cars off of a cliff edge or something. So. It's, it's cool and fun to see the Q gadgets and the, the mines and the torpedoes, um, but it, it, it's also it, it, it's always helpful to have Bond being more active instead of passive in a chase. But this is a nice little sequence, and what's great here, Bond thinks he gets away, two more boats come in, Jaws is there, and we have the reappearance of John Barry's iconic 007 theme, which is unfortunately the last time that it was ever used in the series, and it's one of the great shames that it hasn't reappeared anywhere since. He also scores it in a much slower, progressive style that makes it a little bit more somber, and it does fit in well with the rest of his score. It doesn't stand out as being a classic theme, which, of course, it is, as it was first used in From Russia With Love, but it's really cool that he was able to work it in one last time, and it's it's one of my great regrets that it hasn't reappeared since. 
I've always loved the boat explosions here. And they, they always seem way <laughs> wonderfully over the top when the two speedboats explode. And of course, as with all Q gadgets, uh, the boat will be very quickly disposed of. Now, when Jaws comes up here, of course, it's projection, but I've always loved the way that when he starts firing the Uzi again, we see a close-up first, we hear the gunshots, as if he's just lovingly firing after Bond. He's like, one of these bullets will hit you, and I will be so happy. Now, of course, we're coming up to the falls, which are a incredible sight to behold, but uh, because it's such a incredibly difficult bit of terrain to shoot on to say the least uh it curtailed their plans and so the boats going over did have to switch to some model work um that is location footage the hang glider coming out is a really wonderful touch unexpected and of course poor q will have his beautiful work destroyed once again but uh you know the actual hang glider going over the falls is ridiculously difficult and dangerous to do but it's all undercut by Jaws having the complete cartoonish, goofy look, although it is beautifully goofy when he jerks the steering wheel off. And, of course, when they go over the falls, it's a model shot. But it is very well done. And then we get the nice soaring music cue as the hang glider starts to descend. And, of course, again, Rogers Bond having a sort of uh, live and let die illusion with the hang glider along with the Glastron jet boat. So after that nice bit of action, we now get a much more sedate section of the film as Bond will start wandering around in the jungle and then see uh, the first of the Drax women fully uh, clothed in their long flowing white gowns, uh, sort of spectral-like appearance to uh, lure him into the ancient uh there she is under the waterfall so of course we go from the everglades and then some of the location work was in uh, mexico and south america and then we go back to bits of uh you know brazil so it's it's hopping around everywhere here at this point and it's beautifully cut together especially the shots around the falls here but it's it's something i've always thought very interesting and again selling that otherworldly quality i i think moonraker represents best and Barry's cue really highlights it here. The fact that Bond is wandering around the jungle and is following around this beautiful girl who says nothing in the long flowing white gown. She looks almost ghost-like. And then she goes into the structure and we see this incredible Ken Adams set where uh, it's all ostensibly, this has been carved out of the rocks and the base of the structure above to lead us into Drax's secret facility. Um, but this is just incredible design work. Uh, slightly reminiscent of his uh, Dr. No facility uh, being carved out from underground Crab Key, and you see some of the natural formations in there. Well, here you see it in this set with the rocks, and uh, it's very expansive. You, you wish you could spend an hour in this set almost, but of course the movie has to leave it almost immediately. And it's of course built around the central pool because this scene is going to be Bond's duel with the Python. Now we have here the reappearance of all of the lovely ladies we've seen throughout the film in Drax's terrestrial empire, fully clothed in their Drax uniforms. And they all come out and give Bond these wonderful sort of smiles with a sort of anticipatory uh, quality, which we can't quite read as of yet. We know Bond has found the villain's lair. And it's lovely that they let the moment play out, and then they sort of nod, then the false rock, and then we see the python appear. And then I love how they wait, and then as soon as Bond sees the tail go into the water... He realizes the danger, swims away. That's when Barry's cue comes in. It really enhances the drama of this, which is an absolutely terrifying uh, thing to consider. And it's really sold by the fact that this is really a python underwater with a real drainer, you know, and it's really wrapping around him. Uh, of course, when they break water, it's Roger with obviously a, a false python, but it's well cut together, especially with the reaction shots of all the ladies 
starting to smile malevolently. And then we get the little glimpses of the pen and we think back to the poison pen. And that's how Bond will escape. But it is, it's not done immediately. So Bond really has to struggle because, of course, he would very quickly die um, had it not been for that pen. So it's a real moment of danger. Bond gets to the edge of the pool. He's gasping for breath. And then he freezes. And we see Jaws, who is, of course, also dripping wet from his uh, plunge over the falls. And then the moment when his hands go over the camera lens is a really nice, impactful moment. And then childishly, Bond just punches him in the gut once. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I have to get you back. Now Drax appears without all of the uh, external airs of civility, but he still has that wonderful societal quality that's almost inherent in him. Uh, and again, the great line, you defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. And now we get the scene where the villain will, of course, explain the plot to Bond, uh, the talking killer syndrome, as Roger Ebert liked to call it. And, you know, this does give us the uh, necessary exposition, but it is done well inside this, again, this incredible Ken Adams set, which uh, being on the backside of that previous set and being a completely different design, but with that uh, triangular sort of shape that Adam was known for, uh, for um, his Doctor Strange of War room and the Goldfinger Rumpus room. And also notice all of the screens and video screens and projection screens, which at this time uh, were exceptionally difficult to do because you also had to think about film lighting and how to make sure the image is maintained. And the fact that this set still has the full uh, amazing Ken Adams style is just really another phenomenal Ken Adam showstopper set inside of another one. And we still haven't got to the big one of the film in the space station. So here Drax explains how, of course, he improved on the uh, orchid's powers of, uh, you know, its poisonous qualities that eliminated the race who originally built the temples above them. And, uh, you know, a little bit about... Drax's dream, and we see the scope of how he's able to do this, which is taking the place of the uh, equivalent scene in Spy, where Stromberg has uh, the control room on the Laparis and talks about how he's going to instigate World War III. And that's where Bond realizes that Stromberg is insane when Stromberg isn't out for money. Well, here it's the same sort of thing happening, uh, but it's, it's not spelling it out in words. Here we see Drax is going to destroy humanity. He has the means to do so, and it's already in progress because the shuttles are launching already. So whatever Drax has planned, we know it's not good for humanity, and it's already in progress. So Bond is already too late. It's already started. So it is building up that tension a little bit more already, which is always helpful. And I love the fact that you know you have Drax here just admiring his handiwork, watching the screens go off. But Bond is still thinking at 10,000 miles a minute, and he will, at the very last moment, he will actually solve the mystery he was sent out to discover in the first place. When he asks Drax, Drax one last question, why he stole the shuttle from, you know, ostensibly the Americans and the British. And I love the explanation where Drax literally just says, one of my own uh, got screwed up in the manufacturing process, and I needed that one back, so I just stole it back. So ostensibly, Drax would have gotten away with all of this had he just waited like an extra month or two to finish another Moonraker, which is, it's of course, he wouldn't have had to care because, of course, he would have already destroyed humanity anyway, and no one would have been there to stop him, but... You know, had he not stolen back his own shuttle by, you know, killing the people transporting it, uh, MI6 wouldn't have sent Bond out to investigate in the first place, and Drax would have gotten away with it. Um, but it's just a nice little bit of, uh, you know, the villain's comeuppance is because he was too proud of his own uh, goals and his own powers that uh, his hubris was that he could just steal back his own shuttle and he thought nobody would investigate. This is another incredible Ken Adams set, which is set up first as an office, but of course is revealed to be underneath the uh, Moonraker 5 shuttle. And of course, love the fact, the very ominous moment when the uh, lovely circular desk collapses back into the floor, and then the roof actually opens up to reveal the exhaust nozzles. 
and then to sell the size Drax appears in a match shot very small but it's a very well done match shot it works very well and uh, you again you wouldn't even think about it until you actually look at it very very closely with a critical eye and once again Drax gets another great bit of villain one-upsmanship where he's killed Bond again and of course he does leave because he does have things to do and his leaving will be what kills Bond. Bond still does not give up and this is a moment where we see the usage of a Q gadget that was not previously set up so um, it is a little bit more of a surprise it's always better when these are set up but uh, the little explosive string line Seiko watch is a fun gag. And Bond does, like, draw it out to the very last minute that, uh, you know, it's, he only explodes it once it's uh, past the 10-second mark. And what's interesting also is this is technically a little bit of the Moonraker novel where there is a rocket that Drax is going to, uh, you know, send to London to destroy it. And uh, they are around the nozzle of the, of the Moonraker itself, but uh, they escape by getting into the air vents, and uh, Drax and his henchmen use steam hoses to try and burn them out. So the fact that Bond and Holly are crawling through the vents and the fire is chasing them, trying to sort of burn them out, is, is I think, a nice allusion to that moment of the novel where the uh, burning steam is, is uh, chasing them through the air vents. Of course, maybe it's a little bit, uh, a little bit ridiculous that uh, they just go to the side and the fire goes past them. But uh, you know, a little dramatic license. Again, the sets and combined with uh, the designs and Derek Meddig's work, and also the fact that they had great participation from NASA about the uh, as yet unreleased space shuttle. Uh, the idea was that. Moonraker would come out about the time the space shuttle was actually used, but uh, Moonraker beat NASA to the punch for uh, uh, you know a decent amount of time. But uh, it helps with the realism that the Moonraker shuttles are based around all of the NASA designs, and it looks exactly like the iconic space shuttle. Now here we're back outside of Paris inside these wonderful caverns, which apparently is where they get the materials to make plaster of Paris, interestingly enough. But it helps to sell this whole notion of this being underground. But, of course, we've now changed uh, locations again. And, of course, you have the little vehicles and the private army and things which harken back to You Only Live Twice and Spy. Um, and I love the fact that Drax's organization has an intercom system complete with its own announcement chime. So it's, very, it's run very businesslike and is very efficient. So that makes it... Uh, you know, something much more difficult for Bond and Holly to demolish because it is run so well. So, uh, you know, it's lucky that they immediately come across the pilots for Moonraker 6, but, uh, you know, that's the best way to uh, infiltrate the next part of the plan. And, of course, harkens back to Only Live Twice, except this time Bond will not be spotted by carrying his air conditioner because, of course, uh, they're actually going to make it on the shuttle. And... Um, it's funny how quickly they get on, like, right before the shuttle launches. <laughs> but uh, that's helped because Holly says very uh, conveniently it's on a uh, preset launch program. But they get their seatbelts on very, very quickly. Imagine had the shuttle taken off and <laughs> they hadn't got their seatbelts on. So I guess it's a very good thing that Bond had that centrifuge training to be able to make it the uh, 3Gs. Again, uh, the work of Derek Mendings in this film, this film would not be, it would not work without Derek Mendings' genius and his work, particularly with these launches. And here, this shot when the shuttle is actually leaving the Earth's orbit, I mean, it is so well done. And all of this was done by hand, and all of it was using, uh, you know, what were then even old fashioned techniques. So it was all models and miniatures and front projection and not using any really of the innovations that ILM had just developed on Star Wars. And it, the, the effects really do hold up very well. Uh, and they are to be commended for that. And that's all due to Derek Mendings and his team. And now we've finally made it into outer space, and now we get the full fruition of that otherworldly quality that I think Moonraker has throughout. And I think it's so important that it's had it up to this point that now dramatically, now that we've made it into outer space itself, we are in an otherworldly plane. So the whole film is built up to this. And it's not just like, um, had Bond gotten into space, you only live twice, it's sort of like, hey, we're in space now. 
uh, which some of the other spy craze films of the 60s did and were not very convincing in how they did it. And this is John Barry's Flight into Space Cue, which is so incredibly dramatic. Um, we get a little bit of the weightlessness because, of course, everybody in the audience was immediately thinking, where's the people floating around? And for the most part, that does work pretty well, but obviously it is people on wires, and you know, if you look closely, you can spot that. I do like the fact that they spin the shuttle over to, you know, right itself around the Earth's orbit. But, of course, you know, in outer space, the regular um, spatial uh, um, dimensions are not the same. This is my favorite part of the sequence where they turn on the cameras and Bond is able to realize the further extent of Drax's plan by seeing all of the people we've seen before, but they're all coupled up. And Bond makes the uh, Noah's Ark illusion and that Drax's plan must also be to repopulate the Earth in his own image. And then this incredible moment here where we see the two lovers kiss. John Barry's score becomes so emotional. And then we get this incredible model shot of the Moonraker coming over the rim of the Earth as the sun rises behind. And then we go right back into the space march as we converge on some point in space of which we don't know what is there yet. Just an incredible moment, beautifully put together. And then suddenly the rockets fire, the music drops out, which is really dramatic. Because, of course, we've converged on this point and we see nothing but a black star field. And Bond spots something a glint in the distance as the sun that was coming over behind in the shot before I mentioned starts to reveal something in the distance. And we hear this light chorus of voices start to come through, which is, again, very otherworldly. And then as the light illuminates it, we get the fruition of the flight into space cue as we finally see an actual space station <laughs> revealed for the first time and we get the enormity of Drax's plan visualized in front of us and the idea that somebody could build this and no one would know is explained here by Holly saying there's nothing on the radar scanner which means as they talk about later on there's a radar jamming system so again if you look at the design of this it has this wonderful like hand uh, hand stitched quality almost it's very rough and it just seems plausible enough if you know Drax had the ability to do this which he apparently does and uh, has more advanced space technology than anyone on earth he builds the radar jamming system first and under the guise of doing all these moonraker tests continually brings pieces up and cobbles together an actual space station with its own uh, you know artificial gravity projection and the way it orbits around the Earth. It, it, the design just seems so brilliantly conceived to suggest that this station is cobbled together and it's designed to be able to house the Moonrakers, the way they dock on the individual arms. Uh, again, hats off to Ken Adam. This is a incredibly designed uh, space station that is totally different than the uh, iconic... 2001 wheel type space station which is really the only major uh, space station in science fiction films that most people would have been aware of that was realistic and that's another thing I think the science fiction elements of Moonraker always get criticized because they talk about the laser guns and things like that. But if you look closely, uh, the shuttles are designed after NASA's actual space shuttle, and the space station itself is designed to try and be as plausible as possible. I think that does help enough uh, realistic grounding to be there, and they try to do the simulated lack of gravity and then the fact that it has to start orbiting around the earth to create a uh, gravity simulation, you know, all these things would really have to be there. So I have always appreciated and applauded the film for that, that they at least really tried, even though this is still Moonraker, uh, it should be uh, something the film is credited for that they did try to have some science fact in there. Uh, although, you know, they still have Marines that could launch in five minutes and laser guns in a few minutes. Uh, and obviously there, and, and we do have an actor on wires, but, you know, trying to simulate a lack of gravity 
outside of building a centrifuge as they did on 2001, you know, that that was literally all you could do at the time. And later on, when they have the entire uh, group with all the extras, uh, when they uh, when they break down the, and remove the artificial gravity, that is still an impressive scene, seeing all of those actors on wires at the same time and incredibly difficult to do. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It's still people on wires, but, uh, you know, it is very well done for the most part for the time period. I've also thought it, it was probably a, a cheeky end joke, the fact that all of the spacesuits and all of the Drax outfits are in yellow, which immediately makes you think of the primary uh, astronaut jumpsuits in 2001. For example, Frank Poole's outfit is yellow and looks very similar to the yellow Drax astronaut outfit that we see here in Moonraker. And again, we have that nice reappearance of the little Moonraker woo -doo 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 chime with the uh, very businesslike Drax intercom system. What's also cool here, there seems to be some bits of deleted materials. Uh, there were some extra shots in the trailer in the space station sequence and in the novelization, which again is written as a Fleming pastiche, there's some really cool extra bits of Bond and Holly sneaking around and seeing some extra stuff on the space station uh, and like seeing the Drax space age cafeteria. And then the, there's a really interesting moment where they see sort of like the the mating ritual area rooms where it's it's designed to enhance the mood so they could uh, repopulate the earth much more quickly so again the novel the novelization is much darker is very much written in the fleming style and what's also interesting is there's an extra little bit added to drax's plan where when he gives this speech here in the film, we think, oh, he's just, uh, he has a god complex and he wants to kill all humanity to then repopulate it and rule over his perfect physical specimens in his view. But in the novelization, it goes a bit further. So apparently the impetus for this was not just that Drax was bored, but he got started on this plan because he was actually worried about overpopulation, which is a, uh, you know, a real issue that uh, no Bond film or Bond villain has ever tackled, although Nicholas Meyer made a really striking proposal in the late 90s to have a Bond film villain uh, plot be about overpopulation. Um, so actually, Christopher Wood's uh, original idea was to have Drax do all this to combat overpopulation by simply killing everyone um, which is a really interesting very grounded very dark twist to this which already does have really dark implications and so i can't help but read that in to the film now now that i've been able to read that novelization so i can't suggest that highly enough if you've especially if you're one of the people who've always felt that moonraker was too light and too goofy uh try reading wood's novelization because Wood did do a number of things in his uh, script drafts that were dropped or changed, such as uh, that were actually used later, such as um, originally when they went to the falls, Bond and Holly would fly over in the Acrostar mini jet, which would uh, not be used, was later used as the pre-title of Octopussy. And then he also wrote in a keel hauling sequence where Drax keel hauls Bond and Holly, which is the climax of the, of the Live and Let Die novel. That was also not used, but it would get recycled and would show up in the next film for your eyes only. So it's interesting. Uh, they never they never just threw things away at Eon. You know, they would always recycle things and tweak things and reuse them. But it's interesting to think uh, Moonraker that we know of could have had some more uh, Fleming bits in it. Like it could have had the keel hauling sequence and it could have had the mini jet from Octopussy as well. So this, of course, is the dismantling of the radar jamming system. We get a little bit of cuteness with uh, Holly doing this lovely bit where she goes to ask a question, socks the guy in the jaw, and this will set up the wonderful uh, little back and forth where Bond gets to look on admiringly, finish the second guy off, and then they similarly d uh, dismantle the system in varying ways. She goes through and takes the radar screen off, and then Bond just jerks out the power cables also to tie up the guys. But the the funny line being the, where'd you learn to fight like that, NASA? Vassar. And now we will get the transition down to ground control of various forces because all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a freaking giant space station just appeared on radar. 
you look very closely at the technician there in the white shirt and glasses and dark hair that of course is a uh, series producer michael g wilson who started out doing odd jobs literally doubling odd job on goldfinger and uh, he started making cameos as well in the films some are more obvious but uh, his first major one is here in moonraker and then uh, ever after he would make blink and you miss it cameos throughout the films he'll also appear again at the very end when uh, we get the control room again and this is a nice little bit where walter gotel's general gogol that we see in spy return and he's on the red phone yeah, obviously in Russia, but uh, he seems to be a bit grumpy because he's been gotten out of bed. But uh, we get the lovely comic payoff of problems, problems, and he has a lovely lass in bed with him. Now, of course, it is definitely a little bit ridiculous at this time in the 1970s that the U.S. could launch an entire contingent of space marines in a space shuttle, which they still couldn't even finish by this time, and get it prepared and literally launch it within five minutes. So, yeah, that is a little bit ridiculous, but maybe we're just not privy to how quickly the U.S. response time could actually be. And this is a lovely little reintroduction to Jaws. Uh, again, there's a little bit here they did shot that was in the uh, they did shoot. It was in the trailer where uh, Bond punches Jaws, and Jaws has a close-up and shakes his head, sort of sarcastically, no, but that is not in the finished film. It's one of those little bits of trailer pieces you see that uh, is not in the film. But uh, yeah, also Bond once again hitting Jaws in the teeth, hurting his hand, and then kicking the groin area and having a metallic clank is, again, another moment where the film goes too far into the goofy realm. And also, you have to pay attention to the fact that that shuttle launching is more Derek Mending's miniature work. So just as on Spy, his miniature work is throughout the film and extraordinarily effective. The scope framing throughout the space station is very well done. Uh, here, it's probably, a I don't know if it's quite a diopter shot to have the foreground of Drax and the background of the operator, but it is racked over to Drax. The best line of the film is... You appear with the tedious inevitability of an unloved season. It's the best for me of the Drax put-downs, which are up there as some of the best all-time Bond villain put-downs. And Michel Lonsdale de delivers them with such relish that it enhances all of them. And this, this back and forth between Bond and Drax has an extra dimension because, of course, Drax is like, now there is no way you can possibly escape. <laughs> and my finally what dream is proceeding, you know. And now Bond can watch it in his final moments of life. Of course, if you were Bond by this point, you have to be wondering how many times you were going to find yourself in this scenario exactly. <laughs> Shots like this, while they build the tension, it does show off the beauty of Ken Adams' design and just... Uh, you know, the the scope of his genius is just incredible just to see it physically realized like this. And again, look at uh, if you look at Lunsdale's Drax, he has an almost almost joy in his performance at this point. And he's starting to talk about his new world. And then without any hesitation, spacecraft appear, uh, approaching, prepare to laser it, which of course... Now we see another appearance of a laser. Now it's a giant, uh, you know, laser mounted on the space station, which, of course, uh, this is getting into fantasy type of technology. So the, the ability to launch a contingent of space marines in a space shuttle in five minutes and there being a bunch of lasers and things, those are the, the fantasy elements. The way people describe Moonraker, you would think that it's, you know, guys flying around the whole movie, but it's really not. And outside of those things, if you could actually strip those out, it really wouldn't go too far into fantasy at all. So, again, the fact that there is a good deal of science fact throughout Moonraker is actually keeping it somewhat grounded. It is, you know, on one hand, it is Spy Who Loved Me in Space instead of Underwater, but it does have enough of of science fact of that time in the late 1970s that it doesn't go completely into crazy fantasy land but some of that does start to creep in and that combined with the slightly goofy elements you know causes a lot of people to have a knee-jerk reaction against the film 
But Jaws having a girlfriend is utilized here because Bond is able to psychologically manipulate Jaws into realizing that he is expendable in Drax's eyes, not just for his own physical qualities, but then Jaws reasons that this extends to Dolly as well. So, you know, that's the ultimate no-no. So (laughs) now he has changed allegiances and Bond has gained an ally. But interestingly, it doesn't work, which again builds tension. And this will lead Bond to have to as a last ditch, disable the artificial gravity, which is a nice inspired touch and is sort of the tried and true way Bond will uh, eliminate and destroy and start blowing up the villain's facility by hitting some switch or doing something to cause turmoil to then allow him room to work, as it were. And I love how he cues in Holly with the with the elbow and then Jaws picks this up because Jaws is not an idiot. He's able to barely lunge and hit the switch. And then we see the full effect of the gravitational uh, pull being turned off because we see all the various parts of the space station. And then we see the, the meter tick down. So again, this for what it is, this is very impressive because you have all these various people intercut with the beautiful models and the sets on wires. And it's great that, you know, the actual U.S. forces notice that it has stopped rotating. And also this makes it able for them to actually dock on one of the arms. So it serves multiple purposes because otherwise it would have been much harder, if not impossible, for them to get up to the space station rotating and actually dock the shuttle on to then, uh, you know, attack from the inside. And yes, this is some of the actors just walking very, very slowly, but, you know, trying to sell artificial gravity without going to the links of 2001 you know it's at at this era that's about all you could do and of course the line open the cargo doors means it makes you think of open the pod bay doors how um this sequence of course is redoing the underwater battle from thunderball which is of course redoing the gypsy camp fight from from russia with love and while it is completely ridiculous you have a space battle with a bunch of guys in EVA suits and laser guns. It is really dramatic. John Barry's score, the long shots, the shots of the the ostensibly the sun glinting on the anti-glare visors, and then all of these effects had to be done by hand. And uh, there is a shot that's got about a hundred uh, passes on it, which means rewinding the film, adding an effect, filming it over, and one mistake ruins it. And I'm pretty sure it's this long shot, the long shot with all of the space marines and all the lasers and the space station. Uh, you know, it's really well done. I mean, there's not a bad shot in this whole sequence, but it is, you know, completely over the top and but also fantastic in a certain way. And the moments when you see the the bodies going off into the distance has that haunting quality, uh, very much like when Frank Poole is killed in 2001. You see his body just careen off. And I like how some of them get inside, uh, you know, obviously the blown hatch, and then are immediately just killed. And it's nice how... The gravity is started again right after the outside force has docked. So Drax's forces are still trying to fight back. And it's obviously a much smaller scale battle than what we got aboard the Laparis and Spy. So it is once again redoing the same sort of structure of Spy, but it's on a different path by this point. It's still the same structure, but it's a different tone and it's a different scale. The scale of the villain's plot is much bigger, but the actual final battle is much smaller. And every time a globe is launched, the way that sonically the effect, you hear it going off into the distance, and you know that, you know, that globe, if it reaches its predetermined point, means the deaths of countless millions, you know, even though they destroy the station, there are still three globes out there. It's fun how everybody gets back to normal. And then immediately, <laughs> all hell breaks loose. That's another one of the classic alarm effects. You will hear it turn up immediately uh, in the next film, uh, and for your eyes only, when the St. George's uh, starts to sink. 
And again, yes, you have guys running around and you have laser blasts going off everywhere, but like, we've been established with all this stuff by this point. So by now, it, you just, you're not supposed to think about it. Yeah, it's laser guns going off everywhere. <laughs> And as always, the villain tries to get away in the middle of, of, of all of the explosions going off. But I love how Bond follows after him. And they get to this one destroyed corridor. And you hear all the laser blasts going off in the distance. And the explosions stop. But then the smoke goes in front of Drax. It's wonderfully dramatic. And then the sparks go off behind Roger. Bond is approaching. Drax has no way out. The airlock is behind him. And then he finds a dead guard with a gun. At least I shall have the pleasure of putting you out of my misery. And then the hands go up. Desolated Mr. Bond. And then before you remember it, you suddenly see the hand come up. And you see before, right before the wrist dart gun, you immediately remember, oh, he's got the dart gun. And it's got the cyanide tips he hasn't used yet. So it's fun that... Drax gets just enough time to realize the horror of his plan being torn apart and the horror of how he's going to die. And, of course, it's the same manner of death he suggested for Bond and Holly. We get a classic one-liner. But, of course, as in the tradition of Bond films established, once the villain is, is dispatched, we still have something else to go. And instead of it being a henchman here, as uh, perfected in the Guy Hamilton films, the space station is breaking apart, so they not only have to escape the space station before it blows up, so they have to escape with their lives, but they have to destroy the globes as well. Now, I've always loved how much the walls start moving, not only the explosions, but you see the actual station itself crumbling inside the set and the walls tearing back and forth and literally uh, compounding together because they're imploding. And then we get that intercut with all of the footage of the exterior being destroyed and we see the arms breaking away. And what's interesting is this was achieved very simply where... They had all of it on a giant blacked out soundstage and they just started hitting it with giant shotgun <laughs> blasts. Now moments like that again really sell the Dolby Stereo. So you get a lot of nice mono surround usage which again for 1979 Moonraker is mixed very well. I know John Barry had a lot of issues with the, uh, the balance between the music and the sound effects, but for this time period and it being you know very early for Dolby Stereo, um, especially compared to other films which were not mixed anywhere near as well, uh, you know outside of you know Star Wars was at the top and the Lucasfilm titles you know they were really pushing the boundaries of sound mixing, but uh, you know for for this type of an era of film sound, Moonraker is mixed exceptionally well. And, of course, now that Jaws has changed allegiances, Bond and Holly get on the Moonraker shuttle, and you have to wonder, okay, are they just leaving them? Because, you know, that's essentially what they do, is they just leave them. But we get a nice bit where Jaws is able to assist because the docking system has jammed. And, you know, this bit starts out okay. It's a little... I mean, yes, it's a little hokey, but Jaws looking around for his lost love and things, uh, it, you know, it, yes, it's definitely a little silly, but I would take this being somber much more than uh, how they first met being too goofy. And the long shot here of them running up slow motion is just, it's really goofy, but John Barry's music is so wonderfully somber that it undercuts that. So it does help it play a little bit better. And, of course, they find the one unbroken bottle of Bollinger, which itself is a, a gag in the remnants of the space station. And, of course, Jaws will use his teeth to uncork it. And now we get the one time he speaks. So if you thought Jaws was a mute killer, if you read Christopher Wood's novelization of Spy, where it said that Jaws had his vocal cords cut, um, well, that went out the window. But at least he did get one line, so that's... It's, it's nice in a way, but it, we didn't exactly need this, but it is woven into the film. So you, you can't hate 
Jaws and Dolly and the 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 whole subplot of Jaws getting a girlfriend, you know, as as everybody likes to call it. You can't hate it too much. It is woven into the film, and then they have this bit here where Jaws is able to break the lever, so they're able to escape in the shuttle. But again, you would have to think, why wouldn't they just have them get on the shuttle and sit in the back? You know, why do they leave them on the space station? But as if to uh, you know, already correct that for audience thinking. That section breaks off, and then it ostensibly flies off into the distance. But if you look closely, it looks like it's going to fly off into space. But, you know, Bond says, don't worry, they'll make it. It's only 20 miles to Earth. Now we go into the globe hunting sequence. But here, the implosion of the space station, I, I've always loved. Of course, there are no explosions in space. You have a little dramatic license, but it is really well done. A nice rumble in the stereo track there and then i love how they at least try to make the explosions immediately fade out because again no explosions in space and that nice little sound effect john barry's cue comes in with that space march we got before but here it's hyper focused because of course it's the tracking of the globes this will become more dramatic because, of course, it becomes increasingly difficult as they get closer and into the Earth's atmosphere. And here you could make the assumption that the Star Wars influence is at its most heightened because it is very similar to the Battle of Yavin and the Death Star Trench Run, which, you know, as, as a kid being a, a giant uh, James Bond fan and then getting into Star Wars, you know, Moonraker was catnip for me, but... I never made that assumption, uh, uh, that connection, until other people pointed it out who criticized the film for being too influenced by Star Wars. So I think this is the one scene where you could maybe make that argument at its strongest, but this is still well done, and it's dramatically built up, and Roger really sells it, although he's just literally in front of a console, but they do bring in the submarine-style red lighting when they get into the Earth's atmosphere, which helps to increase things, and they have to switch to manual, which that's the moment where it gets most like Star Wars because there it's almost like the computer malfunctions just like the targeting computer in Star Wars, and Bond doesn't use the Force. He uses his own Force, you know, by by going manual targeting, you know. Um, so if you wanted to make that argument, you, you could... But I, I, I don't know if it was exactly intentional to try and lift this from Star Wars, but it is built up well, it is well executed, and it works because this is the climax of the film, and you need something with extra oomph to it. Again, here's the red lighting, very submarine-like, like when the submarines get captured in The Spy Who Loved Me, but this whole sequence is sold by the editing, by John Barry's music, and by Roger's performance, particularly at the very last moment when we get the close-ups that get closer and closer, and then we finally get the extreme close-up of Roger's sweating face in the red lighting with steady, steady. And it helps that Bond misses several times. So again, the, the drama is built up well. And all of the elements, the red lighting, the performance, the the actual way that the targeting crosshairs barely cross over the globe, so it's hard to do. Uh, you know, it, it, it. and of course, Bond gets at the last minute, and if you look very closely, you see the coastline start to appear, which I think really helps sell the sequence. And when the explosion happens, it lights up their faces inside the cockpit. Now we have a line, you know, assuring the audiences that Jaws and Dolly survived. They were picked up. And, of course, we have now a repeat of the discovery of Bond and Triple X and Spy at the end in the Stromberg escape pod, except here they're in space. But although it's the same setup, I love the... the Again, the emotional quality of this and the sort of romanticism and the fact that they're in space and then they add the fact of the the, anti, the lack of gravity and they start to float upwards. And, you know, for having the Bond film close out, you know, this 
this becomes iconic because it's, you know, not something you see every day. <laughs> and no one certainly um, has, has relations in space all that, all that often, if ever. <laughs> And there is the most classic of all cue lines. And then I love the way that Bond notices the camera, does a slight smile, in the knowing sort of way that only Roger could do. And here in this gorgeous close-up of Lois Childs where she says, take me around the world one more time. Why not? It's just a, a wonderful way to close out the film. The the notion that they're just floating around in space and they'll go around once more. You know, it's it it's a it's just a wonderful, almost poetic way that they close out Moonraker. And it, it's it's something the film doesn't get credit for, that it can hit these certain aspects and it's not just completely goofy. Uh, as it often gets labeled as being. So the the main issue is that everyone sort of got carried away <laughs> while shooting the film in France and all over the world, and the budget kept getting bigger, and the film kept getting bigger and richer, and as you could say about Thunderball, the, the kitchen sink got thrown in, and everyone realized once the film was finished, you know, it was extremely successful. It's the most successful Bond film in uh, up to that time period, not adjusting for inflation, but kind of like what happened on Thunderball and You Don't Live Twice, they realized they had to scale back down, which, of course, led to the concentrated effort in doing that in Four Your Eyes Only. So it was smart of the producers to tackle Moonraker at this time period uh, in the immediate aftermath of Star Wars, and it is a great film for what it is. It should be understand understood within that context and how well it is made. Again, all the money of that $32 million budget is on the screen. But it does have eloquence. It is a film that is not something you will see again. It is not the type of film that is made anymore. A grand, lavish, globe-trotting over-the-top at times adventure that is all of the high elements of life all of the rich aspects of life in one fantastic larger-than-life package, which is what Bond can be if you're going down this path. And it's closed out here with a beautiful shot in space with the sort of disco-ish end title version of the title song. James Bond will return in Four Your Eyes Only, which, of course, was the credit on the end of Spy, but that was changed in order to do Moonraker post the success of Star Wars. So, again, Moonraker is a film that I feel is... It has preconceived notions in everybody's minds, and a lot of times people today haven't exactly even seen Moonraker. Uh, it gets you know, even talked about on the Internet before uh, people even have seen it. They know it's the film where Bond goes into space, and they know some of the more over-the-top and goofier elements that creeped in, and that sort of colors their, per their, uh, their perspective going in. But it also was not received well by diehard Bond fans who had grown up with the series or seen every film and loved, you know, the Connery era of the 60s and the more directly Fleming-inspired titles, which is understandable. But, you know, the, the core elements that are still there, Bond himself is still Bond. Uh, and the majority of the film uh, is still completely devoted to spycraft and Bond having to do, do, do uh, detective work and having to face real mortal peril. So I think the issue is more of this sort of... That it's, it's that slower rhythm the film has combined with this richness and the, that it's a French production and it feels different. And again, it is almost the same runtime as Spy, but it feels so much longer. It's, it's, not, it's not ever languid, but uh, you know, John Glenn does another great job on editing the film, but he's not able to you know, give it any, um, any energy and, and increase the tempo any because there's, there's nothing to cut around. So it is a slower moving, slower burning um, pacing 
which gives it a different quality, and it is a richer, more lavish film, and was produced in an entirely different environment and shot by a different cameraman who has a different sort of style. Uh, so while it is repeating a lot of what you've seen in The Spy Who Loved Me, and it's mostly the same cast and crew coming back, and it is working off that same plot structure, it's a richer experience, but it's also a more... Uh, a, a, a more again going back to the idea of it's like much more like if you sat down and ate a very lavish very rich uh, so like five course meal as opposed to a normal meal that was well prepared you know it, it, it's 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 on the lavish side and that starts to creep into the overall uh, film's effectiveness and the time period of when it came out and the star Wars connection. And uh, you know, that makes people automatically jump on that and talk all about that. And then they talk about where in certain points they, they went a little too far in the humor and it became a bit goofy and you have jaws making, uh, you know, faces and, and there are moments that feel almost as if they're straight out of a roadrunner cartoon, which is something that, those sequences with Jaws always get labeled as. And I think people are, are right to point that out. I think you can label that almost as having a sort of Wile E. Wile e. Coyote vibe to it. I do think they, they went a little too far in some of those. But they th- those elements don't completely wreck the film or the experience. They don't derail the film. And to hear people talk about Moonraker, you would think that it's terrible and there it's just goofy, cartoonish humor throughout, and it wrecks the whole experience, and the film itself is not that good, which is completely not the case. Because even if you are a diehard Fleming, uh, Fleming fan and you prefer the grittier, more grounded Terrence Young style of the original films, um, which that is very much my own uh, personal preference, you have to be able to appreciate the richness in Moonraker and its positive aspects, of which there are many. And especially now in this time period, again, as I said before, this is a kind of film they don't make anymore. And... Most Bond films have never gone this big uh, after this. Uh, you know, they, they do have their big moments, but, uh, you know, throughout the 1980s, they never went this large again. And it is something to appreciate. You know, this is the last film to have the elaborate, larger than life Ken Adams sets. And it sort of marks an end of an era in that sense because it was the last film that Ken Adams designed in the series. And, um, you know, they went bigger than they ever had before. And, but it was intelligent of Cubby Broccoli and everybody at Eon to realize that, you know, they had pushed it a little too far. And they recognized that some of the humor went a little too far. And there was some cartoony stuff that had creeped in. And that it was a little languid in the pacing. And it was a little too rich. And that it had just been a bit overbaked in the process. And that's the key of producing, is recognizing where you made mistakes and where you should have course correction and how to continue forward and not lose your audience engagement. And again, Moonraker was ridiculously successful. It was the most successful Bond film ever made to that point. Again, not uh, not adjusting for inflation, just as Thunderball had been in 1965. And again, the parallels to Thunderball in its success in particular and being the fourth film of a new actor's tenure, I think are very important to notice. But, you know, it, it was a bit of a risk to go away from the formula they had established on Spy and Moonraker. And so For Your Eyes Only became a concentrated completely obvious effort on everyone's part to scale back from that and again it's a course correction that then uh, stayed on for the rest of the decade and all five films would be directed by John Glenn who moved up from the editor's chair and the second unit chair so Moonraker is another crossroads of sorts Uh, just as Spy was uh, Spy was the film that was the make or break point for the series 
Moonraker became the point where they realized they couldn't keep this up and keep going bigger and bigger and bigger because you lose effectiveness, you get away from the core character values of what these stories are supposed to be, but Moonraker still at its core is a great film and a film of vast riches that should and can be explored and enjoyed even by Bond fans who are dyed in the wool uh, Fleming fans. Uh, so I, I feel that the whole Bond fan community should maybe be a little bit more uh, open-minded about certain films in the series that, again, always get labeled as being the black sheeps. And there is a lot to really like and appreciate in Moonraker. And so that's what I really tried to focus on in this commentary. And I hope it's been entertaining. Again, I finished one of these and I feel I've barely scratched the surface. I have about a million thoughts a minute every time I rewatch the films. And I just wanted to try and have a nice conversation about the film and look at it more seriously and uh, try to do some character analysis and scene analysis and you know try and talk about the production a little bit but it's almost impo- it, it is impossible to try and get all of this in to the film's runtime and do a running commentary as the film unspools in front of you um, also I would highly suggest reading Christopher Wood's novelization of the film which is just as good as his novelization for Spy also written as a direct Fleming pastiche there are some differences and some really great bits that are not in the film and the novelization literally reads as if Ian Fleming wrote a novelization of the film story so it is much darker and the nice bits of mortal peril Bond finds himself in the film are magnified in the novelization and just as the spy novelization does once you read it you're able to read in so much more to the motivations and the scenes within the film. So I think it really enriches the film experience, even though it feels completely different because it is pure Fleming pastiche. So uh, please go and seek those out if you haven't before. They were published in paperback with, and uh, as a tie into the film's release, and then they weren't reissued until they popped up as an ebook, I think on Amazon a couple years ago, but then they went out of print again. But you can dig them up, you can find them used, and I highly suggest you do so because it is a very easy way to be able to look at Moonraker in a more serious light and then go back to the film once you read that and you're able to then read into the various characters much more deeply. And uh, it is interesting to read some of the production histories and see how Christopher Wood had some different ideas that didn't make it in and how he did have some more serious uh, Fleming inspired writing and uh, you know I think he might get blamed too much for some of the film's inherent silliness but uh, you know Bond films they're not quite made by committee but everybody has input and uh, pretty much everybody from Christopher Wood to Lewis Gilbert to Ken Adam to Cubby Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson they all admitted that everybody sort of you know contributed and contributed to the film maybe going a bit too far in a few places so uh, I think it's interesting to note that Wood himself in his writing and some of the elements that were dropped and used in later films actually had a lot more um, serious writing than what he is often known or uh, spoken of for. So uh, with that being said, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed me babbling on about Moonraker, which is, again, a film I think has vast riches and as more time goes by, it you really it, it really hits you that this is the kind of film they just don't make anymore. And it is enhanced now by the fact that it is completely devoid of any uh, CGI usage and everything you see is actually done for real. And that even includes the globe trotting and the high living aspects and uh, getting to see parts of the world that uh, you would not normally see shown off beautifully beautifully filmed and photographed and uh, with a absolutely fantastic John Barry score that really marks a sort of departure from his earlier scoring style for the Bond films and he would sort of follow this on through uh, the rest of the other Bond films he would score up to and including The Living Daylights in 1987. So again just as Spy did, Moonraker is sort of a line in the sand for the Bond series, and they then applied a course correction, which would appear and last for the rest of the 1980s to come in For Your Eyes Only. 
So with that being said, this has been my commentary on the 1979 masterpiece Moonraker, directed by Lewis Gilbert, the 11th film in the James Bond series, and James Bond will return, and I, the motion picture analyst, will return with my commentary for For Your Eyes Only. So as always, very humbly yours, motion picture analyst. <laughs>